Welcome everyone. The 11th, the December 11th, 2018 select board meeting is now in session. Uh, tonight, we'll, we're going to do three things. Primarily have a brief discussion about changing the evaluation process for the town manager. Uh, we will approve some liquor licenses. And for as the third uh, main agenda item, we will hear the last in a series of uh, public presentations and discussions on the municipal side of the town budget. Um, previously, I've just said town budget, but when I say town budget, I mean the municipal side of it because that's what the select board uh, gets involved in. The school committee has their own budget. Um, so, um, all right. First, I'd like to start with liaison reports, public comment, and the town manager's report. Um, Dan, would you like to start us off with liaison reports? Sure. Uh, uh, no liaisoning to report on, but I would like to make it clear to the board and the public that the final signed Comcast and Town of Reading contract uh, has been executed and is available for examination on request. There are no reports. Um, I briefly went to the school committee last Thursday evening and was happy to hear that uh, Chair Elaine Webb and Vice Chair Linda Snow Doxer will join um, the ad hoc committee um, to establish uh, human rights. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Um, and that's it. I have no report. Okay, John? Um, not a necessarily a committee, but um, I, I, I do want to report that um, the Postmark project is going to its next step. Um, I'm liaison to that particular project. I know that they've been into town hall, um, spoken with Jane, and um, some permitting is going on, and you know, it's showtime. Great. So they're getting ready to go. I'll keep you posted as that goes. Sunoco Station 2? doesn't exist anymore. Snoko's so, guns are Snoko <laughs> Station. Yeah, well, the gone. building doesn't exist anymore. It's so. a smoking hole. So we assume something's going on that on that front as well. So we're getting fruit from the seeds. Excellent. Okay, uh, moving on to public comment. If any of you would like to uh, speak, please state your name and address and direct your comments to the chair. Any public comment this evening? Seeing none, um, I'll turn it over to Bob for the town manager's, manager's report. Thanks, Andy. Just one quick thing. On Monday night in Wakefield, uh, Wakefield's town council with a C uh, approved the uh, intermunicipal agreement 7-0 to zero for Perfect. our shared assessor. Great. So that's it. Perfect. Okay. We get Victor, huh? We get Victor, yeah. Can't escape. All right, uh, the first item on the agenda is, oh, oh I should ask, are there any uh, oh, topics that were not reasonably, in, in, reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting? Nope. Just give people a, a chance. Um, <clears throat> so the first action item is uh, changing the town manager evaluation process. Uh, this is something that Barry proposed having a discussion about last week, and um, given that each of us had some, uh, we're not fully satisfied with the previous evaluation form process, um, and Barry has has a motion um, before the board. Uh, due, to, due to time constraints last week, uh, and we desire to get through most of the municipal budget process. We delay that until now, and that discussion. Um, but um, I guess we can we can um, take ten minutes and have a discussion on it this evening. Um, so I'll ask Barry to read the motion. Ask okay. for a second, and then we can open discussion. Okay. Can I just before I read the motion, Absolutely. can I just sort of yes. Give kind of read. prep yes. it a little bit? So, um, you know, briefly, um, I think all of us um, agreed that when we did Bob's evaluation process, that that the process itself we found at, at best wanting. Um, 
it was sort of haphazard. I think it culminated at our last meeting when we, we, we did town met when we did sort of the goals and you know that was sort of a, a frustrating conversation but really it, it, it's it, it wasn't unanticipated because the whole process from the beginning was sort of not well thought out and so um, when we did uh, Bob's contract we, we did put in some dates and time certain about some of the, 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 the process of evaluation and so what I'm going to propose is something that takes a little bit I think from the school committee's way of doing it but but not totally and and, and that is is that we had discussed town manager goals we discussed board of you know select board goals we, we discussed joint goals and I think that kind of gets confusing and so what I would like to see us do is implement a process where we have because we as a select board we need to do two things one is we need to supervise our employee but secondly we are the policy setting group um, for the town so like when Bob does his goals and it's like you know setting the tax rate and doing classification and hiring a DPW director those are sort of the day-to-day -day mundane operational stuff that's not really goals goals are something that we all can kind of agree with as a policy and say as a town we want to move forward and do this and for an example I'm just I'm throwing one out it doesn't mean something that we're committing to it so for example we can say our goal is to increase the uh, the CIP factor of commercial property from 10% to 12% as a goal. And, that gonna, and that's going to follow all different kinds of different strategies and things that we need to do. Sometimes that'll be multi-year kinds of things. But the goal would be something that's measurable, something that's accountable, something that we can go to back and forth as a group. And so I think if we start with that process, Right, and then um, where we're all in agreement, and, and and again, this is not to to substitute for Bob doing the day to you know the day to day stuff, but just having a set of goals that we collectively agree upon, and then figure out strategies for implementation, and then we have something to evaluate, and a, and and then a form that basically that we need to do to kind of to kind of do that. Over the last couple of years, it was kind of easy because our goal was to keep the lights on, right? We were running out of money, we needed to have an override. So that became the overriding goal. And if you remember what we did, we came back and we discussed and we changed and we did all different kinds of strategies and we we, 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 we pivoted when we when we needed to do. I think now that that's done and behind us, we need to be more forward thinking and thinking about the kind of goals that we want to put forward so that our town manager has kind of the direction set from us and that we also then have, there's a buy-in and that we can evaluate that. So. That's sort of the subtext. So with that, um, you want me to read the motion? Please. Okay. Um, to create a subcommittee of the select board, two members, uh, which will have the responsibility of formalizing the process of evaluating the yearly performance of the town manager as stipulated in the contract signed between the board and the town manager. The subcommittee will recommend to the full board a yearly process and timeline, parentheses, with date certain, for creating jointly agreed upon goals between the board and the town manager and a suitable form for board members to evaluate the town manager's performance based on those goals. The subcommittee will also consider implementing multi-year goals. In carrying out this task, the subcommittee will work with town staff, including head of administrative services, the head of human resources, and the town manager. The subcommittee will present its recommendations to the full board no later than April 1, 2019. I'll second. Okay, open it up for discussion. John. So, what I heard you say before you read the motion and what the motion says sound like two different things. Okay, I mean, the motion <coughs> is to create a subcommittee to better evaluate I mean that's right that's the purpose of this motion am I correct yes okay and then what you talked about leading up to that was that you'd like a different look at how goals are either arrived at and what they might be the, the content so <clears throat> I don't think you were suggesting and the this doesn't I, this motion doesn't suggest that we're not we're now yet one month further along in the goals that we started with in June. Those are all. Yeah, I'm talking about. That's yeah, all staying yeah. intact. I'm talking about as going, was. going forward. Okay. Yeah. So this motion <clears throat> is really just about the recreation of a better evaluation system that's going to be more closely tied to what Bob's goals are. In this case, this year's goals are this year's goals. Um, and it's going to give us an opportunity for better feedback, I guess, is what I'm 
what right. I'm right. reading into this. So um, I just wanted to be sure yeah. we weren't right. starting over again. No, but the, no, we're not starting over what we just did. This is no, sort no. of a look. This is a look forward. forward. Perspective. Yeah, yeah, a look forward. And I think the notion uh, of of jointly created goals was something that we did not have in this process, which I think made the process dissatisfying for most of us. You know, we did our all evaluations based on different forms. You know, Andy and sort of putting it all together sort of culled out, you know, put down as goals some of the things that each one of us put in our individual forms, which were all done in a different way. What I'm talking about is making the goals jointly created and, and and so I'm not saying how to do it I'm just saying let's have the subcommittee figure out a process by which that happens and then then we everything can get evaluated based on stuff that we've all jointly kind of yeah. done together well I would just suggest that the you know the policy review subcommittee is meeting this week as I recall is that correct yes okay. uh, Maybe, maybe more than one. Andy yeah. and I are meeting yeah. Thursday right. at yeah. seven. We're primarily discussing yeah. session two. The po we, yeah. It's it's the, po it's the policies. Yeah, it is the policy. Um, you know, you're in order to do what you're talking about, Barry. You're going to really have to almost install install a policy that says yeah. we get to this early. I mean, we, what we can't be doing is what we did right. two weeks or last week. We're chasing our tail. Yeah, I mean, these things got to be done. I think right. by the 30th of June, um, and you know that way Bob's got a year uh, to operate with whatever is a mutually agreed upon you know set of goals. So there's a date certain on your April 1st for the um, committee to report for the for the evaluation process. And, and the way we set goals, either multi-year or single year. Yeah, but not the goals themselves. No. This is the April 1 deadline date yeah. Just for having the process. We got, uh, agree. So we give ourselves a couple of, you know, yeah, yeah, three, three months, months to okay. do it. That should be All right. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to jump in. Barry, I agree with you. I think the process itself was clunky. Um, but if we have, we're doing something new this year, to your point, which is the select board goals. And so you have communications, policy, we have the RMLD subcommittee, we ha you and I have the economic development. Um, there's a variety of other temporary sort of subcommittees that we've established. And we haven't, even in the six months since we've created those, maybe a little less, we haven't made tremendous progress that we're reporting back. I hesitate to add one more subcommittee at this stage. Can I, may I make a friendly suggestion or a friendly amendment to change the April 1st to perhaps June 30th? So that that way, perhaps at the start, at the end of Q1, the subcommittee can meet after we've made progress on all of the others. Because I've been asked where we are on communications, and we've hit the holidays, and I think we've all stalled out a little bit. So, friendly amendment. I mean, no argument. We're working our behinds off. And um, and it's another it's another it's another thing. Um, but if we wait until June first, now we've got another. You know, it's almost like we're giving up on next year. You're not going to get those goals together, yeah. the kind right. you're talking about. Right. If you wait to have the that's the only. I mean, done in June. I, I agree with you that you know well, it's just another you know, mm. but, but just to, because of the fact that we were sort of laid on some other things it's like th this is important and I don't want to go I, I really don't want to go through another pro another year where we're just where where we're not I think collectively coming up with what our agenda is going to be and so I, I think we need to kind of implement it sooner rather than later I, I don't I don't disagree with you though um, it's it's gonna I, mean, I think we need to deliver on what uh, just, we are just sorry Dan yeah, um, regarding the April 1st day, I, I would actually like to be one of the two people here because I think I, I have a lot of background here in it. The April 1st date is a good date from my standpoint, uh, and I wouldn't want to lose that. So I, I'm going to suggest that... You can't I, do stuff when you're not here. Uh, hardly. No. <laughs> not hardly not. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I would suggest that perhaps there might be another member of the board Mr. Halsey, someone who might have a little yeah. bandwidth and be able to work with me on this, uh, and I fully appreciate what Vanessa is saying. That yeah, people Dan, are out just straight. to keep us uh, mm -hmm. on point first. 
we're discussing the policy. The, 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 the friendly amendment. The fr well, the I'm, friendly I'm, amendment I'm asking and if the motion in general. I'm asking if someone else is able to maybe prioritize this between now and April first. That would influence what I think about the day. It, it prioritize whether or not to have a subcommittee? No, whether to have a reporting date on the first. So if, if the committee uh, right. feels, if the, the select board feels as a whole that's not doable, fine. But I'm just asking if uh, someone else could join me and commit to that date, then we can keep that date. So, um, but not to be members of the subcommittee? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that too. I would imagine well, next. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to um, make uh, a couple of, of comments. I think the process is abs absolutely worth worth doing. Yeah. Sorry, um, and but last year we started um, our evaluations had to be in by what date? Is that late August, early September? Late okay. August, early yeah. September, right. So we would have to have an approved uh, evaluation form. Yeah. Actually, you really need that. Right, but so that will be looking, that evaluation that we do end of July and September will be, will be uh, evaluating Bob on the FY19 goals Correct. that we, uh, we just set. Correct. Right? Um, and so the, I see two, two separate things here. Okay. That's one, where I'm going to. Yeah. W one, one is that um, how do we evaluate, the, you know, how do we come up with a better way to evaluate the town manager? And or, or one that is more consistent to all of our the way we, we think and um, and then the other topic is a little different and that is how to set town manager goals. Now, granted, some of the goals uh, will come out of the previous fiscal year's evaluation. Um, uh, could or could. Um, not too sure. And so, and then, but my biggest concern is we committed earlier, I think in this summer at some point, to, uh, we, we listed a bunch of goals as priorities. We, we um, you know, we, we uh, prioritized them and set the top five. And uh, and then recently we added uh, another uh, ad hoc committee that Barry and Vanessa are, are working on, and we ha to my from what I've seen we haven't made a ton of progress on those goals. So before we set up another subcommittee, um, I'd like to get those five. I'd like to see before we vote on this some progress on those those five six now so from those five six subcommittees I think it's it's a little um, perilous to keep adding subcommittees on um, and then w when we're not being <coughs> active enough on the uh, other subcommittees that we already have or ad hoc committees yes John I think that you're mixing apples and oranges here we agreed on that there would be five <coughs> goals of this board mm. that we're working on and those are set out in subcommittees okay the the goal that we added last meeting was to Bob's goals okay so those are two s totally separate things we do have so for example right we're you know um, Vanessa and I are working on capital projects and, yeah. and we have met and things are starting to happen and you know in some cases in that the case of that committee for example you have to wake certain things out mm -hmm. 
this particular one, I would urge, since you know you've got you've got another election coming, mm -hmm. it'll happen on April first. We already know that Dan has made the decision not to run for re-election, mm -hmm. so we know that there'll be at least one new person mm -hmm. involved. I think it's really incumbent on us um, to follow Barry's suggestion here of an April first to put this together so that it's ready. So that you know when the new board, because it every April it's a new board. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's the same five Hello. people. I mean, it's yeah. you know it's a new board. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that this is this is a little added burden, but I think it can be get done. You know, two people can get together and get this thing done. I do think that taking advantage of uh, and I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse, but Dan has done some work on this in past years, mm -hmm. and that's been very helpful. We've, we've gone away from that. I think part of that should come back. I do think that the only question here is the date. Let's be aggressive and try to get it done by April 1st. I mean, what? if I'm. Yeah. Uh, the only question, the question, the only question here is not just the date. It's 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 the 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 uh, motion and uh, whether we want to act on it. Um, Vanessa. So you know, John, you do mark up a good point, which is that there is a new board that will be um, that will be created in April, and there is something to be said for including that new board member's input into the evaluation process because that's the individual that will in fact be participating in the evaluation going forward. So the June 1st or June 30th date allows us actually to have the best of both worlds because Dan can participate actively through Q1 and Q2 and then come the new election a new, either one of us four or the new member can join that committee and continue the process. Cool. And it still puts us in line with having the process, have the recommendations come to the full board in time for us to evaluate in August. To a little bit of a compromise. Uh, are you finished? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, just for the audience um, and those watching on TV, um, I wanted to clarify there's, there's sort of three things that we've been three terms that we've been throwing out goals goals and evaluation process the, the select board has we have our goals that we are trying to complete there are five of them now six made up of subcommittees and um, then those are select board goals and Bob has a set of goals that, as Barry pointed out, um, often recommended by Bob and his staff, but agreed to by the select board as a sort of a policy setting uh, uh, approach, pointing them, pointing them in a certain direction. And then there's the evaluation process, which it is a, was a forum last year, and we were asked to rate um, the town manager on various things, um, in, including the achievement of the schools. <coughs> so those are the three things I, I, I believe we are discussing here tonight. So in the, oh, so this, the book, oh. yes, Bob. So I'm going to ask a question based on something you just said in, in Barry's language. Mm -hmm. um, the past evaluations have considered goals but evaluated the town manager doing his job you have the goals being a part of that yeah this form suggests the evaluation will shift to the performance based only on the goals yeah what does the board wish to do yeah that's it's, pretty important to it, it is well, it is and and Barry you mentioned that it's important for us to evaluate the, uh, the town manager as supervisors and then there's also a need to evaluate the town manager on achievement of no, Bob, previous Bob's goals. Right. As I yeah. this. No, I know, but and that's not the way I see this reading right now. 
well, the board should give this subcommittee, if it's created, some idea of whether they want to keep the core competency ratings in yeah. the review, okay. make it more goal focused. Or I can actually it. add a line to this. If, uh, make my and my other thing is that we will continue to evaluate based on the core competencies. All right, that, that would be yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm okay with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that as well. As I, I, as I, I wanted to throw in the concept of goals because um, I think they meant different things to all five of us. And that's not helpful. Thing. Do you want to make that as a friendly amendment? And then if I, I agree, is, is I the seconder? Yeah. The yeah. maker uh, of the motion? You, you are the maker. Uh, yeah, the, the, you, know, the, the, you know, the, the subcommittee will also take into account. Um, How's that? Okay. I, I wanted to also, by the way, there's a dovetailing, Andy, of mm -hmm. Sefer and the work we're doing on sections one and two of the policy, because yeah. I think that's where you'd have to enflesh yes. this stuff, so yeah. that feeds into something we're already doing. It's not like we're ripping something up just yeah. out of whole cloth, so um, I would like to add, uh, just to make sure it's clear okay. here. Oh, right. oh, you did it already. Okay. If you want to accept that, that friendly I have another one. Uh, can't yeah, can we, can, uh, bear can you, you want to read that or you want me to? The change. Well, it's, all it basically says is, um, yeah. is so that we'll to evaluate the town manager's performance based on, on core competencies and those goals that are re referred to previously. Right. Yeah. So. Dan has another. Yes. Uh, that, that one sounds like it's not yeah. opposed. By, no. Okay. No. So that's friendly. Yeah, I just want to make sure there's a directive in here to formalize it in the select board policy. So after the word formalizing, mm -hmm. the term in the select board policies. Right. Down. Second, uh, line. second line. Okay. Maybe with commas around it. it. So do we have it in our policies now? I don't think so. It's That's within the four corners of what our policy should cover, right? We don't have, it doesn't have to go to the bylaws. I don't or, see why it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. It seems fine to me. You're going to have to have a hearing on it. But. Right. Right. Well, we have to do that anyway on the policy changes. So, although isn't it, it formalizing in the Maybe here? Oh no, no, no. no. I was going to say including it in the select board well, policy. Do you have a quorum at the end? Well, okay, you could do it that way too. Uh, we have to uh, do a timeout for a second, so the chair of the FinCom can call them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Yep. See where'd you put it? Yeah, that's fine. That's better one the one I had. Yeah. These in the select board policy. Yeah. So if there's no objection, no. Right. Barry, you're okay with that? Yep. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. Yes. I, I feel like we've had a discussion on this. I think everyone's on board that this is something we should do. Um, again, I would friendly amendment to change it to June 30th, just to give us a little bit more time. Mm. Right. That might have to be a real amendment. That's like, fine. Uh, no. Yeah. Well, it's meant as a friendly. I mean, you, you've got the bandwidth. Is that, I mean, I do. Does anyone else have the band? I mean, if anyone else has the bandwidth and wants to take it on, I feel we can get it done. I'd rather get it done in April. Yeah. If not, then obviously, you know, there's only so much that the five of us are going to are capable of doing. Andy, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to serve. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to serve as well. But again, um, <coughs> I'd like to see, see this. A little extra time for this, like June 30th, as Vanessa said. Again, to repeat, we, we have six subcommittees already ongoing, and and we haven't seen a lot of progress from those six subcommittees. So I'm reluctant, very reluctant, to have us vote on another one uh, without seeing some more progress on those. The other ones don't have dates, do they? No, they don't. But we all set them as well, priorities. Some them, yeah, but we some of them are going to be on. ongoing uh, through the year. Uh, right. We're, 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 we've made a lot of progress on communications. Um, yep. So, uh, and I feel that we're, you know, close to bringing that, and, I would uh, think. We're talking um, policies. We'll go through on Thursday what we plan to look at mm -hmm. and agree mm -hmm. on. A, here's the pieces of work we need to do. I, uh, right. well, it's so, up to the so board in the end. But Dan I, has already, you know, graciously agreed join so it's between yeah, yeah and uh, just one more question on your proposal um, Barry um, so you propose to um, 
formalizing the process of evaluating yearly performance on town manage manager. Um, and, and then what that evaluation will be based on will be created by the Senate. Is that, is that well, no, it's, I mean, it's, in, it's, in, it's in there basically to evaluate it based on jointly put together goals and core competencies. And it has to be approved by the board. We're going to come up with a form, and basically. basically. Yeah. Right, but uh, to me, it doesn't read that way, right? And it says the subcommittee will recommend to the full board a yearly process and timeline with dates, uh, with dates certain, right. for creating jointly agreed upon goals between the board and the town manager and a suitable form for members to evaluate the town manager performance mm -hmm. based on core competencies to those goals. So the 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 the, the, um, the goals are based on what 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 the what I, town manager right. and a suitable right. form for the I'm asking the subcommittee yeah. to create a process or to come up to, to codify, yeah. um, to basically to, to put into our culture, mm -hmm. right? A process on which yearly the town manager and the select board will come up with jointly agreed upon goals and directions. That's our job as policy setters. Yeah. His job is to go and make it happen with our with our help. Right. Also, to create a method, a form, a process by which we can evaluate his performance. Mm. I like the include what we just did based on the core competencies, the things that he's does, supposed to do in his day-to-day -day job, mm -hmm. as well as how the, um, he's working toward implementing those jointly established goals. So, can, can yeah. I suggest that, so we, we have three members for a two-member board, let's pick two and vote. And Holiday. Well, first we have to just agree that we're going to do this, and then we right, then right, we'll nominate. Right. Is how, how it works, right? I, I, I guess would would you consider? I want to make more clear that the town manager's goals, any town manager moving into the future, should be based on policy setting of this board, where the direction we want the town to go in, right? Which right. you mentioned, right. and plus um, goals based on the core competency uh, evaluations. That's what it says. It, it, that's not how it reads right now. Um, it, it, there are two separate things. One is to create a uh, agreed upon set of goals between the board and the town manager. And then the second one is to create a suitable form for board members to evaluate. So, in fact, there's, 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 there's two, yeah. two pieces of work that they have to sort of policies that they need to create to bring back here that we can decide if that's how the direction that we want to go, right? Because right now, the goal, pro the goal setting process, it's not jointly done, right? I mean, yeah. and we had different views of what, you know, there's some people who put, like a goal should be what somebody put in an evaluation. That's the end of the process. The goal should be in the beginning of the process. Right. So just how we define it and how we do it, I think is something that I envision that this subcommittee will come up with the recommendation for how the board goes forward in the future, right? And so, and, and then just the the right the right piece of paper by which we can then mm -hmm. do it, because everyone agreed that what we had was not adequate. So that's the two. Those are the two. That's the those are the two missions. Um, you know, we uh, so that that's what. If we're not ready to vote, or if everyone isn't on the same page, may I suggest that we table it or Good. vote? Because I. I'm ready to vote. I want to. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to table this until uh, the first we our first meeting in January. We already have a full agenda. Jan I mean, is that is, is, is no, we don't. The majority, the majority of folks not ready to vote. I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, yeah, Barry, if you are, I'm then sorry. I, I gotta bring bring this back. Um, bring this back in. Yeah, I'd like to uh, table this. Discussion you have a motion on the first. table. Yeah, yes, we do. Move to table it. You can't yeah, just move to table. I'm moving to table it and get on with the rest of our agenda so we can stay on track. 
does that happen automatically? Does that need to be voted for? Well, you no, vote? it can happen automatically. Oh, no, you have to move to the table vote. and you have to no? I, That's not, I, I think, think that would be that in the policies of what the chair has the power. The better motion is the, the chair is supposed to preside by yeah. uh, over the meeting. If you're intending to bring it up on January 8th, mm. you should postpone to a time certain being that day rather than just table. Yes. Table's indefinite. Okay, so postpone to time certain yeah. for uh, January 8th. I think I have a point of order here. We have a motion on the table. Mm -hmm. It's been seconded. Right. We're discussing yeah. it. I think you have to vote on it. You can make that motion. That's a, a subsidiary motion to any motion to table, it, to postpone all time. Okay, okay. Well, well, let's get on with right. doing something. Let's just vote on something. Just a minute, John. And Dan. Um, this board, um, according to our council, it does not follow, have to follow Robert's rules. Right. You gotta have some rules. You have to have some rules, and, and what we had, and, and that's perhaps we could flesh that out a bit more in the first section of our policy. But right now, all we have is um, the chair approves the agenda. The chair, as far as the chair's roles is role is concerned, and, Look, and, Andy, and there, presides over the meeting. May I interrupt? Mm -hmm. There are basic. There's like a basic set of twelve motions that anybody mm -hmm. uses to table, to mm -hmm. postpone to a time mm -hmm. certain, yeah. to adjourn the meeting. Yeah. That's basic stuff. So mm -hmm. you're saying we're not going to have any of those available to No, us? but but for instance, with this, this exercise, um, I think in, in fleshing this out, I just want to know what you don't have what, to. What do you mean by what you just said about Roberts? We have no rules, we have no ability. No, I, no, I think we're getting off topic. Yeah. Yeah. We're already yeah. behind yeah. on the agenda. Mr. Chair, I, 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 I withdraw my motion. I withdraw my motion. I move the question. I'm sorry. I'm moving the question. All right, John, please wait to be Can I acknowledged. I yes. I just want to understand. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a motion on the floor. There's two friendly amendments, the first two yellow areas behind yes. me. Yes. And then this June 30th that I think is a real amendment as opposed to a friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you put a third motion on the floor. You have to vote on motion. Was, was that a motion actually for June 30th? I don't recall that being said. Um, Vanessa brought it up as a as an amendment, whether she called it a friendly one or not. It's it's out of, it's out as was, was it seconded as, a, as an amendment? Yeah, it was. Oh. Yeah. So you you can't just decide things yeah. without okay. vote voting. You can right. vote to right. agree. I, I I hear you, Bob, and um, I would like to vote on this, but I'd like to wait until January eighth. I'd like to table it to January eighth. Mr. Chair, can I just ask what, what you're going to learn between now and January eighth that you don't know now? Um, I think time to to discuss this further okay. I mean, uh, I'll second Andy's motion just okay. to move us along vote on the uh, motion to uh, uh, move the question to January 8th in favor um, in favor remember um, we're running a little bit behind, but uh, okay, so those opposed? Uh, I, I, I move to, I, I'll tell you, I'll vote to table. Let's just, you know, I, I can't, I can't, just, this is. Okay. Withdrawing your motion. Wait a minute. What is going okay. on here? Wait a minute, Bob. John. John. Bob's over there. <laughs> Three people. Sorry, John. Um, please wait. I am John hand. Robert, but please, you know. please raise your hand, and, and I'll and I'll uh, you know I'll acknowledge you. But I think we just had a vote. Can we just have a Three formal people, vote? So yes. Because who uh, who is in favor of tabling this motion until January eighth? I am. Fine. Let's just take okay. Um, so thank you. I'm opposed. Opposed. Sorry, Dan, John. No. Thank you. Great. Uh, what can I, do? Okay. I mean, just, just move on. All right. Um, now we move on to liquor licenses. Uh, to start, we have a hearing on the transfer of a liquor store license at Patucci's. And Vanessa, can you read the hearing announcement? 
to see the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Select Board of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on December 11th, 2018 at 7.30 p.m. in Select Board Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on the transfer of an annual restaurant all-alcohol license from Bertucci's Restaurant Corp. Uh, to Bertucci's Restaurant LLC, 45 Walkers Book Drive, Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic will be available in the Select Board Pack made public on Thursday, December 6, 2018 on the town website. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on December 11, 2018 to the town manager's website by order of Robert W. Lusher, town manager, uh, December 4, 2018. Second. Um, all in favor? Mm -hmm. just open the hearing. This is just open the hearing. No vote. No, we are just going to try. So, at this point, um, uh, and like Bob, Bob, did you just present the information? Is there already? anyone here for, from Bertucci's? Okay. I don't think um, sure. This is just because Bertucci's corporation went bankrupt, so they are simply just switching their corporation name so that it's in a new name. Nothing's changing in any of the stores, nothing's closing. Um, it's simply just a corporation change. The whole because of bankruptcy. It's uh, only certain stores. Bertucci's with the big B? Or? Yep, Bertucci's. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's all the stores. It already actually went through the ABCC because it was such a big change. Mm -hmm. um, so they did it inadvertently. But you guys formality have to take a vote on it. Right. It. And have to have a hearing. So would anyone like to speak on this on this hearing? <laughs> no? So, um, I have a motion. Yes. Yes. Close. Move the select board approve the annual well, restaurant. Close the first I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, we have hearing. to close the hearing. Second. And I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor of closing the hearing? <laughs> okay. Thank you. I jumped the gun there a little bit. Move that the select board approve the annual restaurant all alcoholic beverages license transfer from Bertucci's Restaurant uh, Corporation to Bertucci's Restaurant LLC. Discussion? All in favor? Okay, um, I think next, Bob, uh, there's the matter of changing the manager at Longhorns, and as well as the liquor, approving the remaining liquor licenses. Yeah, and uh, if you don't mind, let me just ask the, if there's any police officers here who have any comments out there. There we go. Sure. If you have any comments on any bridge. Yeah, the same with the remaining liquor licenses. And this will, um, I think two people turned in their license uh, this year, one of the clubs. Yeah, one of the clubs did and not the paint and sip. And the paint and sip did not renew. Paint and sip didn't renew? Yeah. Really? After all that? Which club? The did, did pay, uh, were, they, were, they, were they were they late or uh, no, no, she, just, she was early and told us she told us that she's not uh, I have a motion. So, yeah, yes. Move the select board approve the change of manager for an annual restaurant on all alcoholic beverages license at Longhorn Steakhouse, 39 Walkers Brook Drive. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Then the remaining liquor licenses as well. Yep, those are just the ones that hadn't come through yet before your last vote. So, okay. um, make the motion. Yep. Uh, move that the, uh, that the select board approve the all alcoholic restaurant liquor licenses for Bertucci's Restaurant Core at 45 Walker's Brook Drive, Chipotle Mexican Grill, Colorado, LLC at 46 Walker's Brook Drive, Mandarin Redding at 296 Salem Street. Uh, for a term expiring December 31st, 2019, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the time, town manager or his designee. Second. Discussion? Sure. Hearing none, all in favor? Okay. Mr. Chairman, there's yes. one more on the other side. Yeah. yeah. 
alcohol. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's finish our alcohol stuff here, because okay. <laughs> I because I do have a question on our alcohol licensing before we leave this. Oh yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. But not. Um, not specific to, okay. to this okay. Okay. All right. motion. All right. Sure. Uh, move that the select board approve the wine and malt restaurant liquor licenses for. Oh, boy. Um, Bangkok Spice. Thank you. Bangkok Spice Thai Restaurant, 76 Haven Street, for a term expiring December 31st, 2019. <coughs> Subject to the following conditions, all bylaws, rules, and regulations of the town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Discussion? All in favor? The last one. That's it. All right, John. Um, while we're on the um, alcohol licensing topic, um, I would like to suggest that at our earliest convenience, we explore. Um, we do not have currently beer and wine licenses available for the any of the convenience stores. Mm -hmm. That has come up several times, um, just in the very recent past. Um, and there is a certain process we have to follow uh -huh. in order to obtain those licenses from the state. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that we do two things. One, and I'm happy to volunteer to do this work with Bob, actually, uh, is to do the research necessary to find out what we need to do if we wanted to do such a thing. And then secondly, have a discussion about that. Um, we've got a lot of convenience stores that are being put at a somewhat a you know a competitive disadvantage with their neighboring towns um, you know they use the convenience stores here in our town and as licensing is happening in surrounding towns mm -hmm. they they certainly can be losing competitive edge here mm -hmm. um, and I think that we need to at all times look after all of the businesses in town um, we know that they're going to be faced with next year some added expense on the tax side I think we should be looking at ways to help them on the revenue side as well and so to that end um, I would be happy to do the research and as soon as we can get it on the agenda um, have a discussion that's just kind of just offering and that this is for convenience stores for a beer and wine license for convenience right, stores right, yes right. we do not possess those in our bag of licenses right. we've got a couple licenses that have come back mm -hmm. you know in this year but we can't just reassign those didn't we do one when we redid it and Bob can fill you in on this yes uh, for the board members that are relatively newer um, a few years ago after decades of research we uh, determined that the alcohol licenses in Reading were at least questionable for many years oh, right. not to say they weren't legal but we just weren't sure mm -hmm. so we went through an unusual process that yeah, made them completely a legal special town meeting through a home rule petition mm -hmm. so we had a special town meeting a home rule petition and off we went um, I, I did uh, speak to town council about this possibility a couple weeks ago and it, it appears that we have to go the same route but what that exact process is I don't know is it going to vote a vote of the voters a vote of town meeting a vote, a vote of town meeting is almost certain yeah a vote of this board is almost certain a vote of the voters is not clear uh, what I'm, I'm saying is I, I am going to visit town council tomorrow I'll add this to the list um, I don't know if it's feasible to do it at April town meeting. We'll certainly make every effort to do that. Well, that's why I'm bringing it up now. Right, because I'm glad you did. I'd hate to have us, you know, have to wait a whole year. If it's a vote of the voters, we're right. going to have a vote in April. Right. And, you know, I mean, if I do think that we need to look out for our businesses as best we can. We know that they're a year away from increased um, tax expenditure, and therefore, I think if there's a if there's a responsible way for them to be able to add to the revenue line, we should explore that mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. So that's why I bring it up tonight, so that because as we all know, government just flies right down the road uh, in the way it gets things <laughs> done. Uh, I think we need to get get out in front of this early. Yep. Um, 
Any other some some other comments from the board? So, John, are you looking for some? Are you looking for permission? I'm, I'm just that, suggesting I, a that it be on our agenda. B, I'm suggesting that I'm happy to do the background work in concert with Bob, so that I can bring it to you. Um, so you've yeah, got yeah. you know. I don't have any. I mean, food for discussion. I don't have any problem with that. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any problem with that. Good. Um, and uh, I, I, th I do think it might be wise to ask um, the Board of Health to weigh in on this. Okay. Um, well, and when we're ready to do something. Yes. I think prior to, as part of the initial discussion, I think they should be included. Right, because... It's public health issues. Yeah. Right? It, could, it could be a public health issue. So, um, and, and, and maybe a public safety. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm, I'm happy. Uh, okay, good. Time. Well, we'll get it moving down the road for further discussion and possible action. Okay. If that's okay. And, and um, you'll let me know when you like this on the, when you're ready to yeah. speak on the agenda. Just, just to clarify, yeah. So you just look for beer and malt licenses for these establishments, yeah. not not hard liquor. Yeah, not a full not okay. a full package store. A beer and wine. It's a convenience store. You know, I mean, yeah, uh, they've got space issues as well. So you know, I think yeah. that this is something yeah. that could fit. I think our cost would be a good one to add to that. Well, I was just well. thinking. That, well, yeah. and as I serve on that board, I'm happy to bring it up to them. Perfect. Um, Great. All right. And I'm liaison with public uh, with public safety, so I'll be happy to talk to the chief. <laughs> that, that, that would that'd be great. All right. Um, so now we move in, on to the last portion of our uh, uh, meeting, the, the, the last of the budget presentations. Um, but uh, sorry, off topic for one second so I don't forget. Bob, would you, um, for January 8th and Barry's amended, amendment, there were some amendments written in there in yellow, uh, highlight, highlighted in yellow. Can you send that out to the board so we have a chance to review them and be, be uh, and there was all set? Another yeah. pending amendment on the date change. Mr. Right? Chair, can I, can oh, I ask a, a, sure, yeah. that we make that the first agenda item on January 8th just so we can kind of get it done? Bob. Right now you have at least tentatively planned the Wakefield 40B, so just bear that in mind. Well, what what, what actually can we do about that as a board? Nothing. So why is it coming before? I mean, I have concerns Dan, about it. They're paying. Dan, they're we're going to write a memo to you, and just like a DRT, as if it were in writing, and okay. the board can certainly be legally you can do nothing. You can certainly ask Wakefield to do things. You oh, we can't. Ask them, no. but you can. Yeah. All right. You could ask to have a traffic study, for instance. They're not obliged to do it. But you could ask. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and so I'm just thinking that might be a full house, just so you keep yes, that agenda yes. item. Well, We'll do it done today. Don't move the yeah, we, we can talk about that, okay. and, but we can get it. Yeah. Um, all right. So a few words um, before we hear the, uh, the last of the municipal budget presentations from the town manager and staff. Um, as it says in the town charter, the town manager uh, proposes his, his municipal budget um, <coughs> following consultation with the select board and that's what we've been doing over the past three nights and tonight so at the, therefore at the end of the presentation um, it, the board will have the opportunity to provide Bob with any with any additional input that you like I think Bob uh, expressly stated an interest in hearing feedback on um, new additions that have been proposed by some department heads, if I read your memo correctly. Or anything else. Or anything else, yeah. So um, I'd also like to encourage comments and questions from the Finance Committee during these last presentations. This is your area of speciality, um, and uh, I think your insights will greatly enhance our discussion. Uh, Bob, tonight we'll hear about the following reti the retirement commitments that we have, or in other words, pensions for our to our employees, health insurance for our employees, capital of projects, and enterprise funds. So, a brief word on. 
capital projects and enterprise funds. Sorry, my braces uh, make it. I'm still getting uh, adjusting to my adjusting to my braces as far as speech is concerned. Um, for the uninitiated, um, which it looks like most of you in this room are, are not, but for the sake of the record, capital projects include the maintenance of and improvements to our public schools, uh, our, pu our public buildings, sorry, which include, for example, schools, library, police, and fire stations, etc. And the other property that we own, such as town vehicles and athletic fields, project and how much they cost and how the town plans to pay for them will be explained in Bob's presentation of the capital improvement plan. Um, enterprise funds are used to maintain essential town services such as water, sewer, storm drain services. It's important to note Bob will present um, uh, on the status of these funds tonight, but it's important to note that when you pay your water bill, your sewer bill, um, and your um, uh, uh, the stormwater rate, um, that money goes back into this fund and partly funds this fund, these funds. So um, they're. Those are fees, not taxes. So it's a little different than than the, than the rest of the presentations we've been hearing this evening. And with that introduction, I'll leave it to Bob. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, tonight we're going to spend a little bit more time on the first two topics: uh, pensions and health insurance. Um, ahead of the FY13 budgets, which is quite some time ago, we lasted a more thorough uh, update that will. Uh, do another one tonight. Then we followed a format that the then FinCom actually had suggested and worked with us on, uh, and they found it at the time very instructive. So rather than recreate the wheel, we just simply updated a presentation. So the presentation wasn't necessarily trying to drive any message on it, it was just updating things that were said seven, eight years ago. Um, at the time, FinCom found this uh, presentation very instructive. Um, I, th I hope you do too. We'll start with uh, Sharon Angstrom and Judy Perkins talking about uh, pension obligation. They'll come up there and then um, I'll get back to um, the health insurance with Larry Tessero and myself, Teresa and myself. So we'll start with these two. Thanks, Bob. So I, I know that you all know me, Shannon H. Jim, the town finance director. This is Judy Perkins, she's the um, HR director, and we um, put together this presentation together. Chair, excuse me, we just have you guys to speak up and drop. Okay. Thank you. So this first slide shows um, all of the um, potential benefits that a, a Reading retiree might, might collect in retirement um, in the employee pension system. So if they're a teacher, they would be part of the Mass Treasure, um, the Mass Teachers um, System. And then if they're not a teacher and they work for the town and they're full time or considered full time, which is 32 and a half hours a week or 1,690 hours, um, they are part of the Reading Contributory Retirement System. And um, that's not a choice. If you're a full-time employee, you have to do that. And anybody who started July 1st, after July 1st, 1996, has 9% of their salary taken up, um, plus 2% of anything over 30,000. So you're looking at about 10% of people's salaries going in to fund their retirement. Social Security, we do not contribute to Social Security as municipal employees, but there are people that have worked in the private environment. I have. If you've worked at least 10 years, um, 40 quarters or 10 years, you could potentially be collecting Social Security, so that's another benefit they might be collecting. And then OPE is other post-employment benefits, so that's health insurance and retirement. That's for the retirees. For retirees. So we, these are some myths that um, they would, had gone over several years ago and we're updating um, that same presentation just to kind of, because these are commonly heard myths um, about our pension system. The town of Reading is generous to employees by having a pension system. 
The fact is in Reading, eligible teachers belong to the Mass Teachers Retirement System, and other employees belong to the Reading Contributory Retirement System, and this is in accordance with the Mass State Law. So it's not them being generous, they're required to by law. The other myth we commonly hear is that the public pension system is free for the public employees and the cost is borne by the taxpayer. Today, Reading employees hired under the age of 30 who remain employed what we call a long-term employee at least 25 years through payroll deductions plus the return on their um, contributions will pay, in most cases, will pay more than the expected value of their um, retirement. Well. Another that we hear is um, public, public pension system employees already get a good retirement benefit from Social Security. In Massachusetts, public sector employees are not eligible for Social Security benefits unless they qualify in the private sector, as I alluded to prior, from another job. If so, they're subject to this windfall elimination provision, um, which will reduce their benefit by about 55%. So the way that I, it was explained to me at trainings I've been to is that when you go for Social Security, um, they look at your 35 highest years. Well, I work 25 years in private, so I'll only have 25, so I'm going to have 10 zeros. And that's how they figure out your average salary for those 35 years, and that's their starting off point. So anybody who hasn't worked 35 years is going to kind of be at a disadvantage for all those zeros anyway. And then after they're done with that and they figure out what your Social Security would be, then they can look at your pension and then offset you by up to $400 a month. So it's not like they get the benefit of both. They actually are being very strongly offset on the Social Security side. In addition, the government pension offset exists, and that's when you're trying to collect Social Security benefits on your spouse's Social Security. They'll actually deduct two-thirds of your pension from that from that Social Security benefit. So I think these are things that people just don't know because they're just not involved, so it's important to point it out. Another myth is while the current rules have changed, we had pension reforms. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was a typical Reading retiree. I'd be living on Easy Street. People really say that, Sharon. Thank you. You'd be surprised. I see the, I see the retirees yeah. nodding their heads. OK. In 2018, the average town of Reading retirement pension was about $32,000 a year. And the distribution is below. Um, so about 45% of our retirees get a pension that's in, in excess of 30,000, 17% between 20 and 30, 10%, I mean 24% get 10 to 20,000, and then 14% get less than 10,000. So 55% of our retirees have a pension that's less than $30,000. So they're not reaping, most of them are not reaping a huge benefit. Another thing I should probably mention, um, before I start this example, because I want to kind of demonstrate these um, slides came from a PEREC um, presentation done by their actuary, um, Jim Lomenzo, and he kindly offered them up to me so I could demonstrate the actual calculation for a, per a person or several people so you could see how this all works. Um, so we all have 9 plus 2 taken out of our check for the most part unless they started prior to 1996. Um, and when it says group one, group one employees are people who have non-hazardous jobs. So when we say group four, we're referring to police officers and firefighters. Um, and they tend to have a different, they're on a different schedule because their jobs are considered more hazardous. So they retire and can get, so the goal for most people is to get to an 80% of your average salary. And that average salary is calculated by taking the three highest years. If you were hired before April 1st, 2012, if you were hired after that, they do a five-year average. But, the, but to get to 80% of that benefit, you need to work 32 years um, and be age 65 if you were hired before April 1st, 2012. And after April 1st, 2012, you'd have to be 67. So to get that combination to work, to get 80% of that average, you have that 32 years in and you have to be at least 65. For group four employees, that age is low, it's 55, but I think they're required to um, retire by 65 because the job is so hazardous. Other um, employees that would qualify under that would be RMLD linemen. Isn't the general manager also? Yeah, four? yeah, she is. I, I don't, they, I don't, I can't imagine she's climbing. But yeah, I think she, she is. Yeah, if she's climbing the pool, she absolutely is. Um, <laughs> <not sure> <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is an example provided by Parrax. So they're saying, okay, we've got a group one employee hired at age 25, um, starting salary at 30,000. We're assuming that their pay goes up 4% per year and they're not capping it. I mean, a lot of um, 
the way we work is that you get the top step and you don't you don't go in higher but this is assuming that their salary grows endlessly by four percent um, and then the employee contributions um, earn six an eight percent return on their investment so this is the calculation the valuation um, done by the actuary and it shows you at age 55 this person would get a yearly benefit of forty thousand five hundred and that would cost $475,000. That's the present value of that benefit. Their employee contributions will have exceeded $566,000, so they fully funded their whole benefit themselves without any contribution from the town. At age 60, um, it goes up to $76,700, present value at 806, and then accumulated um, contributions are 901. So you can see that there's definitely no um, contribution needed here from the town for um, these folks. And then 65, obviously the benefit goes up because they've reached that magic number. And these examples are those people prior to April 2012. Yep. Um, so 65 would be that magic number where they've got that 32 years in and they've got um, the age factor of 65. The maximum benefit they would get was that 106,600, but they've contributed 1.4 million dollars. So sure. Sure, just go ahead, Vanessa. So the difference in the value versus the accumulated value of employee contributions, mm -hmm. where does that difference go? It stays in the trust. Um, so all of the money that the employees um, put into their contributions is invested on their behalf, mm -hmm. um, and it kind of goes into the pool. And so we have, we're offering a defined benefit, so they get their benefit to the date of their death, depending what option that they they select. So if they are option A of their retirement, they get the maximum benefit. But once they die, there's no benefit for anybody else. If they do an option B, um, they do um, they get their benefit to the day of their death, and then there's a beneficiary who can receive whatever's left in their annuity, which is whatever was taken out of their account all along. Um, and then if it's option C, you're covering the, the retiree and their spouse usually. So that's a lesser benefit. So for each benefit, you're getting a little bit less each month. But then they're covering that retiree to the day of their death and then their, their spouse as well. Two-thirds of the benefit would go to their spouse to the day of their death. So depending on that. So if there's excess, it's almost like a gain to the retirement system because they've, they've fulfilled their responsibility to that member. Sharon, could I just ask a question about um, the present, what the present value represents? If am I understanding this correctly, and that that present value represents uh, what the retiree could expect to? Um, it's actually what it costs to provide that benefit throughout their retirement. What, we, what it would cost today to to invest enough to. Um, because they're collecting, the, dollar, they're collecting the dollars today, but they're paying it out in the future. Right. So the right. value of that dollar in the future is a lot less than the dollar contributed today. So it's always discounted. Okay. But with the accumulated value of the employee contributions is just adding all the contributions up every year and then increasing them by 8%. It's like a compounding effect. Okay. And so there, I have actually the spreadsheet that backs this up if it's helpful to see it. Um, yeah. Please don't. Yeah, yeah. No. I don't know that it, no. it might be more confusing, honestly. Um, so we'll move to the next example. In the next example, we have another group one employee, age 25, his benefit, I mean, his uh, pay at higher is still 30,000, but his pay is increasing at 5% a year, still getting an 8% return on his contributions. And in this case, at age 55, he is fully funding. At age 60, he's a little bit short, but you can see he's mostly funding, $48,000 short of fully funding. Mm -hmm. um, and then at age 65, absolutely fully funded. So that's why they, you hear a lot of people say people who are contributing nowadays are fully funding their pension because in most cases they're either mostly fully funding or fully funding. And then we have a third example here. A person is age 35, 50,000 at higher, and then 4% increase, 8% um, per year. In this case, because the person is over age uh, 25 and the number of years in is going to be different, at age 55, possibly they're going to have enough in there, but it's going to be a small shortfall if there is one. And then, you know, at age 60 and 65, there would be a contribution from the town because there isn't quite enough in there. But a lot of it is there. Most of it is there. So even when you have somebody who's a little bit older, the majority of the contributions made by the employee is going to fund the majority. I mean, you're looking at a difference. A person makes 50000 a year, and at age 60 or less than one year salary is the town's contribution to its so retirement. And at 
age 65, less than two years. So a small contribution, even when you have an older employee who hasn't put as many years in. And then at example four, um, we have at age 25, 30,000, and then a 4% increase, but then we're only getting 7% return on the investment. So, so, yeah. so basically, what, what the shortfall is or isn't um, also just depends on the general um, returns on the sort of the, the pension fund. So if it, the pension fund is, man, is managed well, mm -hmm. you know, then basically it does better. There's more there if, if you know. If it's invested in things that are somewhat risky. risky, or you know, we just have downturns in the market, like I just like our four hundred one k's, it goes up and it goes down. So you never really know exactly. I mean, you have no. to you, you have some actuarial estimates about what you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but if the market outperforms that, it it's better. If the market more. does worse, then that liability becomes greater. Yeah. And that changes almost on a year, it changes year to year. Yeah, but, but I think the point is to make that um, because um, they went July 1st, 1996 to 9 plus 2, the intent was to get the employee to fully fund. To catch it up. Yeah, the, bit. yeah because what had happened is for the first 40, 50 years, they were just paying as they went and accumulating this liability that, you know, was going to become unsustainable, and that's why they've increased the, that percentage required of the employee every year to right. get yeah. to a status where really the town's contribution is small, if any, for those folks, right. unless they go out on a disability or unless they're. I would say that the one thing that Jim Lomenzo had said to me when I spoke to him on the phone is that for public safety, you'd be more likely, you know, a group four person because they retire early, you'd have more likely to see that the town has to contribute something yeah. towards it. But still, they're still having nine to ten percent of their they taken out and invested for them for, for many many years so you're going to see a lot of that retirement even on a even on a public safety employer being funded by the employee but they'd be more likely a town share because they are retiring younger so the so the, the the largest component of the liability is probably from workers that started before 1996 or a while ago that did, that basically didn't contribute as much as the workers are now. Yeah, um, actually, I have, I have to go from our actuary um, knowing that I don't I'm know, sorry, remember yeah. these. <laughs> I, I apologize. If, they started, um, <laughs> if they started in 1984 to June 30th of 1996, they were 8 plus 2, so it wasn't much left. Oh, uh, okay. And right. then 1990, 1975 sorry. to 1983, we were 7 plus 2, and then prior to 1975, we were 5 plus 2. Right. So it's the people going back to the 70s that really had the, yeah. the five and the seven right. where they maybe didn't contribute enough That's and fine. we weren't putting in our share and yeah. in, in investing it and having that 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 time to get to what we need okay. to fully fund. Sure. So what you pay in the assessment is really largely towards catching us up for all the years that we didn't put our share in right. and invest it and prepare for those people's retirement. Yeah. We have a question from Sharon, what, what's the experience? What's the average annual rate of return that the pension fund has been? It's usually between, um, I want to say it's a little under 8%. So it's pretty close to the assumption you showed. <laughs> but I think the valuation, that the, um, the most current valuation we have for retirement um, pension is, I think we're, at, we're expecting 7.65%. We're always bringing that assumption down because it's better to be conservative right. um, with those valuations. But back when this presentation was done, eight was the norm. Um, if you're seeing most of them are going um, trending down, um, and we kind of try and follow suit with what you see Craig thinks the number should be. Um, so we're having another valuation for the pension January 1st through the 19th, so just around the corner. And the board has already talked about even bringing it down further, that this can break down even further so that we're more conservative, that we're expecting less of a return, because you can't always get those returns. There's times you get a lot more, and then there's times you get less, and so we want to be more conservative, so as not to have to push it out. Um, and I have some slides about where we stand. But, but the average rate has been north of second half. Mm -hmm. In retirement planning, oh, those are aggressive numbers. Eight's, oh. eight's an aggressive number. And oh, that, and that was, this was when he did his presentation then, but he's like, I already planning. got these slides, but at least demonstrates the point <coughs> about, you know, but definitely we had, like, in 2008, some awful numbers, you know, so, I mean, a, a downturn in the economy can be a, a real hit on these funds. So. Mm -hmm. oh. So the last example we showed, I forget what it was now, <laughs> uh, age, tw age 25, 30,000 at higher, 4% a year, and a 7% return. 
and bringing that return down to seven to seven actually made it so at age 55 and age 60 there is a contribution due from the town um, but it by age 65 so but to get to that 80 percent that magic number a lot of people want to get to 80 percent of their average pay they need to be at least 65. Right. Right. They could have so many years in, but they're not going to get the age factor they need to to get to 80 without without being 65. Yeah. And for me, 67. Yeah. So. yeah, that's that's the real incentive to, to for uh, public employees to retire later on in life because um, they want to they want to max out on their yeah. I mean, they, you know, pension. most people want to get right. as much in their retirement as they can because it's you know 80 percent of your pay. You know, Right. It's, that's even a big deduction. So it's, it's, you know, it's um, just coincidentally beneficial to the person to work, uh, to retire at a later age, and also usually for the town as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the longer the money's there, the longer it came out, right? Yeah. So. yeah. So this is just um, a slide talking about the Reading Contributory Retirement System, which is the, the board that covers all the retirements for the non-teachers. Um, it's overseen by PARIC, which is the Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission. As I mentioned, teachers are covered by Mass Teachers, which is a state plan. Um, Mass General Law Chapter 32 um, establishes and governs all the retirement programs. And the Reading Retirement Board has five members, which includes myself as the ex officio as part of my job as the town accountant to serve on that board. Benefits are based on combination of age and service, and we invest our money with um, the Pension Reserve Investment Trust, which is PRIP. That's where the state and the teacher's retirement is and a lot of local systems. And if you've got an underperforming system, sometimes they're forced into PRIP. Um, we're not in that situation. So we, we go into PRIP, so we're not managing our own funds. So right now, um, we we are 100% into PRIT. Um, the Reading Retirement Board has um, hired an investment advisor who um, was looking at alternatives because our PRIT is investing really with a lot of focus on the state and where they are and where their funding ratio is and where we're more funded than the state. And so the concern is that their risk might be out of, out of whack with ours. Um, and so what we were trying to do is um, find ways that we could control our risk. And so there's a discussion on the table to take out a certain percentage and put it in print sleeves so that we decide where it's invested a little bit more so that we can control how risky the investments are. So it's more the asset it. allocation than yes, kind the of asset the, allocation. Yeah, okay. So that we can control where the money is at to, to control our risk for ourselves right. as we approach full, fully funded. So this is what the membership of the Reading Contributory Retirement Board is. 381 employees, that includes your active and inactive. Sometimes you have people who worked for the town and have contributed um, and then go and work for the private sector and they don't retire right away, so they're considered inactive. And then all your retirees, and they're all broken down by um, their individual departments. This is um, as of the January. Could you, I'm sorry, could you back up on that uh, one? Um, Oh, town school. Never mind. The, the top number, 284, is town a combination school. of so the town so and school employees. So that would be town employees. employees, but then there's people who work at the school who aren't teachers who would be in maybe our system. Okay. So this is um, information from our last valuation, which was January 1st, 2017. I mentioned we are going to have one in 2019. We do them every two years. Um, it shows you that the actuarially determined liability is over $173 million. At that time of that valuation, we had um, just under $128 million, leaving at about $45 million of unfunded liability and a funding ratio of 73.8. That looks bad, but it's really it's not It's actually really competitive, yeah. Compared to what other towns It's have. better than the state by far, yeah. honestly. <laughs> well, I mean, it's <clears throat> better than horrible doesn't mean it's great. No. Right. Okay? I mean, it is better than what's horrible. Um, and, and, you know, we should be proud that we are there. But, but it's still you know, we cannot back away from right. the continued, you know, 
try to make up the underfunding of all of those years. That's mm -hmm. not a small number. No, no. Uh, and it's mandated by the state that we're funding by 2040. Well, it goes on the front of our balance sheet right now. now yep. it so it's not, a, it's not a note anymore in the back. It, but so. the bond rating agency, everybody knows, who, anybody who knows our financials knows well, where it is, but now it's on the face of the financials. If you weren't knowledgeable, you would see it for right. sure. And you have municipalities around the country going bankrupt over this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Sharon, do you expect that um, unfunded number to go should decline as the years pass? We've seen good investment returns, so I would expect it would go down. The other thing that ha affects this liability number is um, whenever we do evaluation, we approve our assumptions, and that can kind of push your years out a little bit because we do an um, improved mortality table, which is a more recent study that determines how long people are living in retirement and all that. I mean, usually what they find is that they, li they are living longer, and so that actually changes your liability. Yeah. Um, we also will improve anything that we want to correct. So if we're saying, oh, well, I, I think that this assumption for increases in salary is too high. We can maybe change that. There's different assumptions that we're making when we're creating that valuation, and, and those changes could be drastic to the liability. So it's like a balance. You could have great returns, but if we make, like, to to decrease the discount rate or our expected rate of return from 7.65 down to where where, where they're expecting us to be, maybe 7.3, that That's can huge. change the liability huge. So we're expecting that we had great returns, but it's hard to know how it all plays out when you factor in the, the improvements that we make in the assumptions to. And this is every two years? Every two years. Every so that's going to happen at the end of this year, yeah. January 1st, 2019. So it'd be nice to see what those numbers look like. So just one last question on this slide and the previous ones. Previously, you were talking about how town employees fully fund their pensions in, in most cases. Yet here we're seeing um, an unfunded liability. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because for 40 or 50 years, they were just paying as they went. So, and the, and so the employees weren't putting in enough to fully fund their own. Um, and so there was a share that should have been paid by the town, and it wasn't being invested to make sure that money was there for their retirement. Okay. So there are people who are retired and have been retired for years that we, right. you know, so. That's what I was getting at when I asked you if you expect that number to decline, um, not you know, not to get into more vividity. What I will say is we're, we have a, a, a date of um, fully funding of 2029, but once we are fully funded, we're never really fully funded because there's always that, they're always doing... Um, you know, the valuation, and they're going to assume worst case scenario. And, and for police and fire, there's probably always a little piece that is ours because they do retire earlier. So there, it'll yeah. be drastically reduced from what we see now, but there'll always be some piece there'll that the town should be putting away because there are situations where people who are in disability and they can fully fund. They need to have those funds available for all of that, um, for disabilities, for, you know, public safety to go out at a younger age and, and will be living in retirement longer than, you know, an average town employee. So there's definitely, even when we're fully funded, there'll be something that we have to pay every year. It just won't be as big. Thanks. Well, you'll have the phenomenon also. <clears throat> People can fully vest and fully fund, not fully fund, but fully vest their years and their pension. And because they're living longer, they're starting second careers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and those, they're not going to be, they'll retire from one yeah. and not contribute any further, which is going to have a direct and inverse impact on the unfunded liability. They also have limitations of how much they can work yeah. in right. the government yeah, right. now. Well, if they, they want the private sector, then Because then no we money. actually take back from them if they earn too much money. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some mechanism there. But if they go and work in the private sector, they can earn whatever they want. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, but, but then, <laughs> if, then, if you're marketable in the private sector, you can serve. Well, you live on employment not. rates today. There's a, there, there are people doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But, but th then they don't get all of their pension during those years, as you pointed out. Well, if they if they are working for mis municipal government, they're going to be offset if you know because they'll actually get money back from them for earning mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. But if they work in the private sector, I'm going to municipal. There's no, there's no, limit. There's no, no offset right. unless they're unless they're out on a disability retirement. That's a different right. story. Okay. But okay. for most people, working in the private sector is not off limits. So. Thanks for the. So they're trying to stop the double dipping. 
Okay, so this is, um, I think I just mentioned this, that we're expected to be fully funded by 2029, but we're required to be fully funded by 2040. Um, so we're not even close. So even if we have to push out years when we approve our assumptions or if we have a bad investment year and it really messes things up, we have mm -hmm. to. Um, and as I said before, the reason that you see those large payments that we owe for assessment is because for so many years they didn't fund it portion. And, and I mentioned again, as of July 1st, 1996, um, they changed it to 9 plus 2 in an effort to make it so that there's enough being funded by the employees so that in most cases they are going to fully fund their own. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so Sharon, there's an 11 year discrepancy between when we think we will be fully funded and when we are required to be fully funded. And, and, and so obviously we're putting in more now than what we could be if we just, even if we wanted just to follow the rules. So it's really, it's a, it's a choice that we're making to do the right thing so that, you know, that keeps our balance sheet in good shape and keeps our rating in good shape and yeah. keeps our commitment to our employees. Mm -hmm. and, you know, As compared made, to other right? communities, we have a, you know, a very competitive date to be fully funded. Um, but we also have another big liability that's out there that's going to need our funding, which is the OPEC. Right. So we're, we're looking to that thing mm -hmm. that has to get funded. It's not mandated to be funded. We've been funding it the best we can with, with whatever we can for the last six or seven years. Mm -hmm. But who knows when they're going to start saying, well, now you're mandated to right. fund that, and that would be a budget buster for sure. So you want to get on that sooner rather than later. Right. Okay. So that's my next slide. Um, <laughs> OPEC is um, benefits in retirement. Um, in order to qualify for our retirement system, you have to work 32.5 hours a week or 16.90 a year. But to get health insurance when your employee is just 20 plus hours a week. But I wanted to make the distinction. If you're not in our retirement system and you retire, you're not going to get benefits in retirement. I just thought it was a distinction that should be made. You've got to be either a mass teacher's Reading employee, or you've got to be in our Reading contributory retirement system to qualify for benefits in retirement. Even if you have re benefits the whole time, if you're, let's say, a para who works 20 hours a week, uh -huh. you qualify for health insurance, and then you decide, I'm going to stop working now. We don't give benefits for the part-time people if they're not a member of our retirement system. So you got to be 32 and a half hours. Yes, yeah, so you have to be somebody who's a member of the retirement system. And I also should mention it's not a choice. If you work the right number of hours, you're in our system. It's required of you. So let's just say, for example, you worked in the town of Concord for you know 20 years, and then you moved and got a job in Reading, and you worked for a few years, but all, all in. You, you know, you've, you've done, you know, what you're supposed to do, but, you know, you only, you ended in Reading and you're only there for a few years. Whose liability is it? Is it say Concord's or is it Reading? They share it. So we build those other retirement systems for their, their portion of the okay. benefit. So, so it wouldn't be like we're on the hook for the whole right, thing we have yeah. for five years. It actually, we build the other retirement systems for their share. They, they acknowledge the number of years that person worked for them and the agreement is very clear and the, on the onset they transfer the funds over to us oh, when okay. they come from right. another system when we begin investing. So we're managing that whole thing. And then we okay. build them for their share. Got it. This is the liability on the last um, OPEB valuation. We're still waiting on one that was just done as of June 30th, 2018. Um, the liability for OPEB is 75 million, over 75 million. And we've, at that time, only had just under 6.5 million. So we have 8.6% funding ratio. So, and oddly, as bad as that looks, so many don't even have that. So. But still, it's a huge, you can see the numbers are enormous, and so we are kind of fast-tracking and making sure right. that we try and stay on timeline for that 2029, because that money is going to be needed to fund. So we were doing about a half a million, was about half a million a 500, year, 000, and then now, 000. are we doing more? 750, I think? Is it 575? 575, yeah, I knew it. Okay. Right. That's what the general fund. I should note that um, RMLD, water, sewer, storm, we fully fund the annual required contribution, so they'll be fully funded for OPEB faster, but the general fund liability. Why Why that not? Because, because it's a smaller number, the general fund. Oh, so it's easier. Yeah, and okay. they're able to do, you know, the number is more attainable. So what happens when you have a valuation is they pretty much say, okay, this is your liability, and you want to fund it in 30 years, and they tell you how much you're supposed to put in right. every year. 
you know, we can't get there right. for the general fund. We can get there for the enterprise funds, and we are doing it. Um, and so that piece of it will be fully funded well before the general fund. We can't right. make 30 years. We can't even do the annual payment for 30 years. So once the um, pension is fully funded, you would expect to see that those funds being redirected. So that's why with fast pension, the, the pensions will get that done, so then that frees up the cash to do OPEP faster. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's the plan. Well, that's, that's what I think the plan is, but right. it could change, you know. <laughs> that's just the current to, to double check that the OPEP is not, does, does that fund does not receive contributions from the employee, like pensions, to, the pension fund does? No, it, because what happens is when we pay our um, benefits, just like an employee that works with us now, mm -hmm. um, the town pays 71% and the employee pays 29%. Currently, the retirees get that same um, mm -hmm. that same package. But when somebody has Medicare, and you could probably speak to it a little bit better, um, that insurance is less expensive than, like, say, our typical Blue Cross Blue Shield. They get MedEx, which is kind of a supplemental to their mm -hmm. Medicare, and it's a lot less expensive for us. And we did a lot of work. Do you can probably speak to it. Um, they did a lot of work to get anybody who is over age 65 onto Medicare um, so that we didn't pay the high <coughs> premiums that we pay for PPOs and HMOs for people that could be on Medicare and getting a supplemental, which is a lot less expensive. So a lot of work was done this past year to get that done, and, um, and, it, and it, I think it will actually show, you know, very favorably for us. Uh, yes, Mark. <coughs> Um, how is the open investment plan? Do we do that? Right now it's done in-house by our treasurer, but we have plans to um, to invest with the state. Um, there's a health insurance um, trust that they do um, that we can actually invest in. But we kind of held off. There were some issues with needing a trust document in place, and so that's kind of sitting with town council. We've gotten all the work done at town meeting to allow us to do that. Um, it's just a matter of moving forward and figuring out, okay, how do we put together the trust fund conditions, who are they, um, and, and getting that document in place, and then we can actually invest with the state, and it would be good to put just like our pension funds. So they would control both asset allocation, control asset allocation? Mm -hmm. Because you'd be, you'd kind of, it'd be like commingling the funds in some ways. Um, so Fred would invest it all. They would know how much is for every community, but they, they would invest it kind of the state being their primary focus is where they are in their funding issue. But we're all kind of not funded at all, so we're kind of all in the same boat. So I think that we would be the same kind of allocation would be needed to get us there. So So Sharon, um, obviously if it's if it's done through crit there's, there's oversights kind of built in, but if we're doing it ourselves, what can you talk a little bit about what oversight there is there if it's our, if it's our own if it's our own board like sort of well the custodian who? of the funds would be the treasurer, but that would be the job of those commissioners that we assign the trust fund commissioners to to be paying attention to. Just like the retirement board, we oversee um, we look at the, the bank statements for print. It would be just in the same fashion as the retirement board. You know, probably meet regular meetings, looking at performance and making decisions. Do we want to stay here or do we not? Like if performance is poor, you know, if we're sitting on a deck that board, you know. We have trust fund commissioners. It's just not entirely clear who. So it's the same trust fund commissioners that do like the hospital trust fund and the center, or is I that a different? I don't know, but is there that? would be some kind of board um, assigned. Okay. Well, is that who's doing it now? The treasurer. It's, it's not. It's not. The trust fund is separate from the old bank. Okay. They don't manage them right now. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't. I didn't but that's, that was kind of the topic of discussion of who, who makes up that board. Who manages that fund? Before we do anything, we have to figure that out, and that was something that was sitting in town councils. Like, tell us how to do this. You know, right. that's okay. what we're not sure of, because that that would be the board that, along I mean, with that's the treasurer, that's overseeing these investments and saying, okay, we're making the right choice. That's an not. important appointment process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's taken quite a while to get there, okay. but we've done everything we need to do at town meeting to get the permission to create the trust, which we have. It's just a matter of deciding where to invest if we want to do the, with the state and, and how to put that board together and all of that and get that trust done in place and you know that that has to be named in the document so we need to know so okay thank you very much Sharon thank you, Sharon. Awesome. Thank you. Okay,
we'll take a five minute break before we uh, go into the next session.
go. So next up is cap capital and debt. Not quite. No, nope. not quite. No, no, no. Health health more myths to Oh, the, the health. The health. Yes. Yes, I apologize. More myths to dispel. Very good. Exactly. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Larry Teresso from Cabot Risk slash Maya. Larry's a healthcare consultant. Um, he's been working with the town as long as I've been here, so many years. Uh, uh, as you'll see, we'll get into the presentation. I'll do about half. Larry will do about half, and then I'll clean up a couple of slides at the end on some uh, other things. But the first uh, myth that we have is, uh, is, again, that town of Reading is generous to employees by having health insurance. Now, this slide looked a lot more sort of neutral 10 years ago, whereas now everyone knows health insurance is mandated in Massachusetts. Didn't always used to be. Uh, town meeting accepted Mass General Law 32B in 1957, making this required. So it was a long time ago. Um, employees who work 20 hours a week or longer are eligible for health and life insurance. Life insurance, I'll touch on at the end, it's very small. For school employees, that's 20 or more hours a week during the school year only, so it is less hours over the year. Um, employees enrolled in the health insurance program who retire, as Sharon mentioned, uh, 32 and a half hours a week, except it's 18 hours a week for teachers who can continue in the program. So those are the parameters it's required. If a retiree passes away, the surviving spouse may continue in the health insurance program, uh, much to do in pension at a reduced rate. If an eligible employee is not in the health insurance program at the time of their retirement, they can get back in and enroll in the program, but there are restrictions. They can't do it any time they want to. There are restrictions on that. Uh, the health insurance system is free for public employees, and the cost is borne by the taxpayers. As the <laughs> Now this story is a little different from pension. It's certainly not self-funding, but you'll start to see some differences. Yes. As Sharon mentioned, we're at a 71-29 percent split. Um, there are many of our peer cities and towns that pay over 85 percent of the premium costs. Um, and again, the town of Reading pays 71. I'm going to say that the average is now approaching 75-25. It's not quite there yet. Um, plan design changes happen in a very collaborative collecting, collective bargaining process. This group called the Public Employee Committee, and they negotiate with the town manager. These are the Public Employee Committee. We have Mark Rivars, our representative for the retirees, is here. Uh, regardless of what happens, the retirees always, by law, have a 10% vote. And you can see the schools have almost two-thirds, town 17, and, and light department 7% vote. So there's the 16 unions plus the retirees that negotiate with the town manager. So, uh, yeah. So, so essentially, um, a teacher contract that's done between the, the, the superintendent and the school committee um, and the teachers. Um, the firefighters is done between you. But when it comes to the health insurance, you're basically working with the committee of everybody, right? Correct. And they do. And, and so essentially, it's not a. It's not a school versus town versus RML thing. Ba basically, the benefits are the benefits for Correct. everybody. So it's not one played against the other. Obviously, there's different percentage in, in kind of yep. that based on the, I imagine how many people there are in the different unions. But essentially, it's it's sort of it's like it's 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 one deal, right? It is one deal, um, which I think is great. It's 16 unions. It's either this room or the next room we meet in. Um, I've invited the superintendent and the general manager from the light department to participate. They sometimes do, but I always have to. Um, <clears throat> and that's the group that negotiates plans and changes, which are the reasons we've had reasonably good success in costs, as we'll get to. Okay. Um, the changes that have happened over the last primarily 10 years have reduced the premiums that we all pay. And when I say we all, that's the 71 in the town and the 29 for the employees and shifted um, to much higher out-of-pocket costs. Those are the users of the health insurance service. So Bob, if I could just, I just want to comment on that last note. Um, that That's really the rub here, um, is that we want uh, the town to be financially healthy, but we also want to attract employees. So y y you don't want their out-of-pocket costs to be too high, or we won't be able to hire anybody, and that's the art of the uh, of, of the compromise. I think that has to be made. 
we're also, if you if you think of um, the private, the typical private sector versus the public sector, um, we're an upside down triangle. We have very few young people, a lot of old people like mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> for health insurance, that's not the model you want to follow. Right. So if we were constantly hiring, some, like a law firm or like Wall Street would do, yeah, and you know there's a 10 percent success rate and a 9 percent attrition rate of 25 year olds, that's a great model to fund your health insurance. Sure, we don't do that. No, so that's a how people tend to stay a while. Say again, how people tend to stay a while. They do, and yes. they're a little gray. Yes, they are, and that dovetails with with what um, uh, uh, Sharon was saying. It behooves people to stay in the town, to stay working for the town longer until they're older, but then you get this sort of inverted right. tri triangle. Yeah. Um, health insurance costs that wrecked the budget in recent years causing an override was a relatively recent myth that didn't exist eight years ago. Well, we did, t I mean, we did say that was a budget driver, right? And that, the I mean, fear of it was a budget driver, but if you look at this over the last 11 and a half years, which is since I've been keeping track of things monthly, our uh, annual rate of spend is 3.4%. And that includes changes in enrollment, which is a, a significant portion of that 3.4%. So the, perm the Public Employee Committee has done a really good job uh, negotiating um, health insurance premium spending at a very modest rate. But when we budget, we are assuming but higher numbers. Right? And, the, and the recent numbers are higher. Um, they've been in the f north of 4 on 5% over the last five years. But over a longer period, you can see what it is. One of the things that we negotiated uh, over my objections, but I understand, um, I don't like to pay farmers not to farm. <laughs> We're paying employees not to take health insurance. It's called an opt-out system. I'm sorry, not to what? Not to take health insurance. Uh -huh. they, they have to have it, so if their spouse can provide it through their employment, mm -hmm. uh, and they take it, and they used to be employed by us and, and take health insurance for two years, mm -hmm. and they can prove that they're being covered by a spouse, um, we'll pay them 25% of what we save, more or less. Um, we'll keep 75%. So last year we spent about $95,000 in opt-out payments. Uh -huh. And we saved about $300,000 on right. top of that. If, if every employer did this, it would be a problem. <laughs> Everybody would but be moving Not every employer does this. Yeah. And that was my objection to it for a little while. But it really it has saved the town, again, you know, $300,000 annually. Yeah. Another myth that was true years ago is still true the GIC would uh, save us millions of dollars and they always will. Now, I got to emphasize these are my comments, no one else's, and certainly not Larry's. Well, for those watching at home, can you tell us what GIC is? Yeah, that's um, the state run um, health insurance consortium, I guess I'll say. Uh huh. Insurance Corporation. The GIC, in my words, are a subsidized shell game. It uses mass taxpayer funds every year to subsidize the true cost of health insurance premiums. So every year, Beacon Hill votes anywhere from 50 to $200 million of taxpayer money to keep premiums down. One year, they were reported to have used upwards of $150 million in a difficult year. Yeah. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying that that's a fact. Yeah. And if that went away, because it's a political tool, if that went away, the shock to premiums would be severe. So the reasons the product is priced as it is is because it's not floating to the market. When Reading was for, Reading has looked at this for many years, the decision to join the GIC is blind to the first year's cost. So you have to sign up in the summer, late summer, <coughs> you don't know your cost until the winter for the next fiscal year. And you have to agree to stay for three years, regardless, you can't leave. Right? So you're going in totally blind. Um, this, this yet, as of yet, still doesn't make it a bad deal. We'll get to that. Um, it used to be when you went in that you lost your experience, with Larry, which is Ariel talked to. Uh, now I believe you can retain that. So if you lose your experience, no one knows where your claims history is. If you go to leave the GIC and go to the bid in the marketplace, you get a terrible rate. So it really was a lopsided situation here. Um, I have heard from my peers over the last six months that the GIC is likely to be divided into the state employees and city and town employees. 
it used to just be state employees so that the state subsidy actually sort of made sense it was going to be money the state spent anyways yeah whether it went to that or went to this it just artificially deflated the employee share of health yeah. insurance well they could just increase local aid and give it to us with their own insurance they could do that but <laughs> yeah that's yeah. not happening <laughs> yeah um, if that does happen then cities and towns very likely will be left to float to the true cost um, and I, I have seen some of my peers uh, leave the GIC that had point. I'll turn it over to Larry now to speak, speak in a little bit more detail. Great. Uh, so good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you tonight. Um, Bob mentioned earlier I'm with Maya, technically working for a firm called Cabot Rich Strategies. I have worked with the town of Reading and the PEC for the better part of 10 years, so been around for, for a little while. Um, I would say the most common question as it pertains to the GIC that I receive, and let me just say I work with about 25 communities on the North Shore. That's my so-called territory. There are about 130 cities and towns within Maya, uh, about 25,000 subscribers, about 70,000 members. The most common question that I, I do receive is, well, how do my current benefits that I have with Town of ABC compare to the level of benefits currently? in the GIC. There are a lot of different ways to kind of get at that question, but I would say the most common baseline is how do the benefits compare? So this slide up behind me really compares our current active benefits, or you'll see them shaded in maroon, our HMO and PPO options um, compared to what's currently described as the, the benchmark plan in the GIC, the most subscribed plan in the GIC. So you see that our current HMO and PPO plan, these two plans essentially match each other. They're a non-deductible high copay plan. So we don't have an upfront deductible in front of services, uh, but you'll see tiered copays in front of office visits. Uh, you'll see specialist copays at $45. Then you'll see hospital copays ranging anywhere from $250 all the way up to $1,000. Uh, Leahy may be 250, Mass General may have a thousand dollar copay. So it's a copay tethered to the place that you render care. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see a prescription copay benefit of 15, 30, 50 for tier one, tier two, and tier three, where the current GIC benchmark, which is expected to change fairly, some are predicting fairly radically in either this upcoming fiscal year or the following fiscal year is a, essentially a $500 deductible plan. So it has an upfront deductible of $500 per member, no more than a max of 1000 per family. And then it has similar copays to what we currently have already in place. Is, uh, is there coverage for tier coverage? four and five drugs? So they could, a great question. They yeah. So yes, but they haven't differentiated them as tier four and five. So they currently still maintain a three-tier prescription drug benefit. Uh, last year they did implement a separate $100 deductible in front of prescriptions in addition to the $500 deductible that's in front of general medical care. Okay, so this spreadsheet focuses on that. In the GIC, there are many plans. There's the most subscribed plan. Most of them, most of the plans in the GIC follow this plan structure. Uh, but uh, you'll find that an overwhelming majority of plans in the GIC have migrated to a limited network format. So they've actually created micro networks or they've, they've contracted with providers or carriers where they're offering limited network plans. We, the GIC and Maya, have actually looked at Maya's limited network plan. And by Maya, I mean Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts limited network plan. And recently we've decided not to implement it because when we did the search of providers that were in the network, it wasn't a really good match for employees. There were a lot of providers that weren't available for, for employees and their families. Yeah. Okay. So when you say there are a lot of plans available, you have two options up there, HMO options, PPO options. Um, those are only two plans? For right? active employees and early retirees. And that's what we offer. That's correct. We don't do the high deductible yet. We are, no, no we're, in, we're we've, we've discussed it. 
So it, it looks like uh, for most things you're in the ballpark with G, GIC. Is that correct to assume? Yeah, based on this current plan, and this should be worth mentioning that uh, under Maya, you have the entire Blue Cross portfolio available to you. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a Maya benchmark three equivalent. So we've actually matched that plan design. So uh, that option is available, but this compares our current offering to what is currently in effect as a benchmark. So yes. Yeah. So the uh, Maya deductibles uh, apply before any of these copay these copays kick in. You've got to so the Maya five five hundred dollars. Yeah. So on, with Maya, there are no deductibles. They have copays. So if you look at the the second line, yeah, in what does that maroon, apply to? That, that deductible, you'll see that it says no deductible. Right. I mean, when you go over to the GIC right. as a five hundred dollar deductible. That deductible with the IC, that deductible applies to just about everything other than um, your primary care office visits okay. and your specialist office visits. Um, and you'll see kind of where it says after deductible, where that deductible applies. Okay. What's significant also, with, which can't be missed here, because uh, it's easy to see a lot of numbers on a spreadsheet. If you look at what Maya's done with their offering, They've, they've put in an out-of-pocket maximum ceiling mm -hmm. um, of 2000 4000 So that one individual, that one family that has a horrific medical year, yeah. they went to Mass General three times, they had lots of chemo, they had things of that nature. Uh, they stop reaching into their pocketbook when their out-of-pocket maximum yeah. hits $2,000. Right. We've even taken it a step further and put a separate out-of-pocket maximum of $1,000 on prescriptions. So someone's taking a very expensive prescription or multiple prescriptions. In a planned year, should they be out of pocket $1,000, the plan pays out 100%. The out of pocket maximum in the GIC, that register doesn't stop ringing until the individual hits $5,000. Sorry, I keep looking past you as you I, talk I, because I, I'm I, reading I, the table. That's okay. um, so, Bob, just to, to both of you, just sort of a basic question. If GIC is being funded by tax dollars, um, subsidized by tax subsidized, I'm sorry, um, then why wouldn't they be offering uh, a better health care deal than my What am I missing? That's a very complicated question. It, it, it really is. is. Okay. Yeah, because remember, the state in and of itself, uh, I firmly believe that the state is doing everything it can to try to f figure out an obvious issue, mm -hmm. uh, addressing affordable health care. Not only for right. cities and towns that are, are attempting to, to enroll mm -hmm. and find a solution within the GIC, but also for its 300,000 state employees. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, the state is self-funded. So it can, it can manipulate things as much as it wants, but the reality of the dollars and cents, they are what they are. Yeah. So they need to try to make it work. As a consultant, one thing that I've seen over the years and that other people subscribe to is the cities and towns that have generally gone into the GIC mm -hmm. are the ones that couldn't get a better solution somewhere else, right. uh, effectively making that specific risk pool it's kind of like little, the high risk pool for, a little more for challenging municipality yeah. or yeah. challenged is question. probably. Y yes, sorry. Um, two questions. One, I had the same question as Barry about the high deductible plan. So to the extent it doesn't harm bargaining positions or whatever, if we can get the close notes on what that discussion was about. And then the second question was, um, are, we, are we fully insured or self-insured? Fully. We're fully insured. They, they may self-insure. So the health trust itself is self-insured, okay. but we provide a fixed cost arrangement for our members. Makes sense. Got it. Uh, so and, on the, and the cliff thing. notes are it is collective bargaining. I mean, it, it has been discussed, I want to say, for four years. Is that about right? Um, and we're not philosophically opposed to it. This stuff is really complex. Sure. And the implementation of a change in the plan, as you can imagine, on hundreds of employees is complex. One of the things that um, Larry provides is a disruption study. So if you're going to make a chance, a change, how many different employees or retirees are affected? Um, and what is their circumstances, yeah. and that's something the employer has to be careful about. 
but it's still on the table. It's it's not off the table. Yeah, it's, I mean, frankly, it's also not a great fit for an upside down triangle, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I, what, a question here, and then then Ann. It's very difficult for the PEC when we get people together. We're looking at 16 meetings. I was say, yeah. yeah. We have a large group. School department is in there. Town manager is in there. And to get everybody coming together and to come up with a solution. When you're talking to the PEC, it has to pass by a vote of 70%. Mm -hmm. right we have one group that is part of the school department that has a couple of the unions have gone in with the teachers and one individual has a 46% vote. Right. When you look at the numbers that you put up there earlier, and you see the numbers, it shows you right there the five unions. It has five people that are going to vote. But they Eight represent like two thirds. Right. Okay. They have a percentage by the number of employees they have. Yeah. I have a weighted vote by state law. Yeah. It's a minimum of 10%. Right. So with the school department at 46% to a particular one, with myself at 10%, we can't control this. It well, has to be a 70% vote. Right. When right. things are brought up by the town, if there's not 70% of the people present, right, it cannot be discussed, it can be not be brought up. That's why it's a multi-year conversation, I would imagine. Yeah. So when we get into discussions, dealing with Bob, Judy, Larry. It's a collaborative effort, and we all work well together. That has not always been the case in the past. I send an email to Bob, I get a response. Same thing with Judy. We work back and forth. So we have a great rapport going amongst the group. It is difficult when you're looking at something like this, if you get individuals that are going up there, and they're deciding the fate of somebody's health insurance and what's going to happen. So it's not something where we only meet twice. It's yeah. something that when Larry presents something, it has to be looked at in depth. Yeah. But the fact we, that... Yeah. We did just make a huge change yeah, this last year that, that yeah. Larry will go into yeah. hopefully is going to impact the insurance rates going forward. Tremendously, it is our belief. We do not know until time comes that the numbers start coming in. But I, I guess the, the question I have, maybe Larry, you're the best person, because you said you do with like 25 different towns. We do. The way Reading does it with getting all of the union reps in the room and the retirees in the room together to discuss it holistically, is that the normal practice? Or so it's is, usually, is that, it's usually one do. of two ways. You're Section 19 community where you establish a PEC, which is the town of Reading, or you go through normal coalition bargaining where it's not Section 19 and you, and you negotiate with each individual individual union and get, we right. still need overall consensus. Right. But cities of this size, most are Section 19 communities, meaning you have a public employee committee. Okay. Right. So yeah. The fact that everybody's in the room together and understands the, the pros and the cons of each of the sure. things. And they're going to collectively decide for what's best, obviously, for their members, but also for the overall right. health of the town. Right. It's a better process than kind of just going around and doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I will add, for whatever it's worth, um, um, this is probably one of the most active PECs that, that I work with, and I want some of the larger cities and towns on the North Shore, so there isn't uh, an option that we haven't looked at. Uh, because it's been so active, um, this post-65 program that I'll go to in just a minute, we were able to kind of make it happen, and it's going to provide material savings, real dollars. Uh, Bob, and then just, I haven't just forgotten. Just a comment that um, one of the things that's been most helpful in the PEC is a lack of turnover. Um, union leadership changes from time to time, but the members of the PEC, the vast majority, have been there a long time, uh, for 10 or more years. And because this is a long-term discussion, that's really, really helpful. Yeah. yeah, great. Thanks, Bob. A a um, Ann Landry from FinCom. So it sounds like the, the town and the PEC have a really good uh, working relationship. I just wanted to um, clarify Bob, is it your opinion that we might see, we would see immediate cost 
TIC, but there, there is just too much long-term risk there because of the way it's subsidized by the state? Um, I don't believe we would see um, short-term savings. One of the things, I, I want to be real careful because I'm familiar with a lot of examples um, in some of our neighbors. Um, one of the shortcomings in the analysis that has been done by other towns is um, if everyone stays in the same kind of plan and they go to the GIC, we'll save this much. What happens when they don't stay in the same plan? What happens when they migrate to another plan because it is cheaper now so they can go to a more expensive plan? Um, one of our peers, not too far from here, um, projected saving three or four million dollars a year. They saved two hundred thousand um, dollars. And then that savings evaporated because they changed their split down to 85-15 from 80-20, so they lost money on the deal. So this stuff is really complicated. Um, and in addition to the complication, at $10 million, it's the single largest item we have as our budget. If you think about Sharon's discussion on a five or $6 million pension item, um, respectfully, that moves like a dinosaur in terms of direction. You know, uh, Maybe it's not funded, maybe it's not funded fully, and it, and it moves in a slightly different direction. But the funding is always going to be up at this point 5% a year. Health insurance could go up 20%, it could go down 5% in theory. Um, it's very volatile. So this stuff is complicated. You want to move it carefully. Um, I can't think of any of my peers that have chosen that option you do, but I know that some towns have. Um, my general comment would be that's the cities or towns um, that have had not so good relationship with the unions, otherwise they wouldn't have had to do that. It's almost like a nuclear option where we don't need to talk to you, we could just implement it. And you can only imagine how that comes back in the bargaining table over wages. So, Ann, if I could add just a little bit of color. Um, yeah, I that. think, did you have a follow-up comment, Ann, before we proceed? Um, it's, it's, it's really going back a couple slides and points. Um, uh, so the, the average inked is at 3.3.4 annualized. And you said recent years has been four or five. But our assumption is when we structure the budget for this year, it's been about eight. Seven, seven and a half, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and what is it for what do we have for this year? What's our assumption? Uh, for FY19, it was seven and a half. Okay. A little complicated because the override added a lot of funding to that budget. And we, so even though historically, and even recently, historically, it hasn't been that much, we still think that that's a, it, it's just a conservative, it, it's a conservative, it's a, buffer. it's a conservative way to do it. Um, it's certainly a discussion we have annually with FinCom, it could change. One of the concerns we had, which I, I personally don't feel it's as risky as it was maybe three, four, five years ago, is seeing the plus 20% number all of a sudden, but we didn't expect it. Um, that's not going on nationally anymore, except in certain pools, small businesses. The discussion we had with FinCom is let's have a conservative number, and then you agree anything that's more than that, you use free cash, um, so we don't have to adjust budgets in the middle of town meeting. There's no good way to do it. If you budgeted 3% and it came in at 5, you'd be looking for money every year. It, it's an art, not a science. I'm open to whatever FinCom really wants, but this way has generally produced savings. And the other wild card is we don't always know what enrollment would be. Right, that's a big thing. Um, part of it is, you know, with an override, obviously we're hiring more people in the town and the school, so we knew that. But we don't know what personal situations are in different families and whether there'll be more or less enrollment with the exact same employees in a given year. And we've actually found that uh, changes in enrollment have been more impactful in a, f in a few years than actually the premiums were. So again, there's a lot of moving parts into this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just going to make a comment, a quick comment to one of Ann's questions to add some additional color because there, there is a lot of detail in that analysis of, of potential savings. Um, but I'll highlight one quick fact. Um, as of September 2018, we have 641 retirees on a MedEx plan, a retiree Medicare uh, plan. Um, that plan in the GIC runs about $400 a month. Um, 
going into 1-1-2019, one, one, that rate with Maya for a better plan, less out-of-pocket cost from the, from the retiree is about $333 a month. Uh, so it's 70 bucks less per retiree per month. Um, so there's this um, perspective of, the, of, of that the GIC can save money, and for some communities it can. There's a lot that goes into the calculus, yeah. is my, my ultimate point. So um, the next slide is a, a Maya value proposition. I know folks aren't here for a Maya commercial, and I'll, and I'll spare you all of that. But I, I am going to highlight a couple of things that I, I, I think are important to the folks in this room that you, you'd want to know about. First of all, the um, Board of Directors is, is run by other town managers, other member cities and towns that they actually dictate. Uh, the use of surplus, they dictate our rate bans, they dictate everything Maya develops from a rating perspective. But more importantly, um, I'll tell you what you're really getting from Maya. Um, any credible group, uh, and, and by my definition of credible group, is a, an entity with more than 100 employees um, where claims dictate your rate development. So not a small employer. You've got more than 100 employees where you're credibly underwritten. Um, you're really buying two things from any insurance pool or any insurance carrier. You're buying administrative expenses and you're buying a claims discount. So you're, provi you're buying a provider contract from Blue Cross and you're buying an administrative contract from Blue Cross. Uh, yes. A couple of years ago, we had gone out to bid. Uh, lots of our members, every That's once in a while, go out to bid, and they, they realize that the Blue Cross direct quote, if it's the same claim coming through Blue Cross, why are the Blue Cross rates higher than with Maya? That ends up being a function of, we're providing uh, an administrative cost basis that a small entity, not 70,000 life entity, but a, a 2,200 life entity can't otherwise get. And in that includes stop loss insurance, it, uh, you know, admin fees. So you're getting the most aggressive <coughs> administrative contract in the marketplace and arguably the most competitive claim discount through Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Massachusetts. If you are a city or town with 50 employees, that discussion's different because you're larger, because claims ultimately de determine the rates you pay. You want the most aggressive claim discount and you want the most aggressive administrative cost basis. And you get those two things with mine. Is that because of the size and the breadth? Because of it? we're seventy. We're Blue Cross the second largest client behind the federal government. Uh, we're able to, as I mentioned earlier, we're able to provide an administrative contract to your rate development, where Blue Cross directly would have to charge you more because they would look at you as 600 employees and they have to get their administrative costs covered over 600 employees where we have economies of scale with 70,000. Uh, that matters ultimately yeah. over time. Um, and that probably ends my Maya commercial. <laughs> ultimately that's what you really care about. Um, um, yeah. Chair? Yes. So, um, from, from what it looks like here versus GIC, we seem to have a very nice looking plan in terms of not having a deductible and having very low out of pocket numbers, certainly compared to the private sector. So, that I would imagine is kind of a, a plus on the how do we get employees from these things. That's, that's kind of point one. Um, as it relates to our experience and how we forecast what an increase should be each year. Rightly or wrongly, we end up blaming you for the big number. So I'm the Grim Reaper. Yeah, he wants to be yeah. blamed. Okay, so um, why the big numbers and, and why, why do we kind of keep Yeah, so um, let me remind folks that um, for 1119, our retiree renewal is a 0% increase. For 
FY19, July 1, FY19, our renewal increase is a negative 0.6. That is the, the level of inflation that we charge on the rates that we bill the employer. Your budgets, when you guys look at your budgets, those numbers may not adjudicate the same way. And that's where the impact of enrollment is material. For As an example, I did literally back of the envelope math as you guys were talking about liquor licenses. <laughs> um, um, we have approximately 50 more uh, folks covered in September of 18 than we had in October of 16. We have 69 more total people covered, meaning spouses and dependents. If I did the rate differential on a per annum basis, that would account for an impact of velocity of enrollment of about $271,000 a year just by having more people on the plan, where that rate on a piece of paper was a negative 0 0.06 or 0 0.6, the budget uh, your budget says, wait a second, my numbers say it's really a plus three or a plus five because we have more people. Right. So the velocity of enrollment is the only thing worse than medical trend. Although we did, we did, we did cover, we did take that into account. The, the override was going to provide new yeah. positions. We 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 put five percent of benefits yeah. in there to, I assume, to accommodate mm -hmm. the so higher cost of adding new people. Yes, yeah. so of course. One quick follow-up, if I could, just follow up, kind of jumping ahead, but just to make sure I'm understanding the numbers. You're predicting that 2019 is going to come in the low tens, and because the, the sheet we're looking at shows it's only going up one and a half percent. Are you so talking about FY20's budget or FY19's? 20's budget versus 19 expected. We'll get there. Okay. I need to still look So Larry's last uh, point here is, um, you know, the relationship that we do have with the PEC and some of the changes that Maya has offered. We, we haven't made all these changes, but we've made some. So um, every July or every, every really right around Valentine's Day, I drive all around, all around the North Shore and deliver rates of increases. <laughs> so with the chocolates. A man on horseback when I ride into town says, hide your women and children, and he just says, he's here, he's here. Um, so that's what I do for a living. Uh, can't change it at this point. So um, boards of selectmen across the Commonwealth, uh, mayors, town managers, continually ask me, what else are you doing to bend the cost curve? Yes, we need to talk about Section 22 or Section 23. We need to get together with the PEC. We, but what else are you and Blue Cross doing to take an unsustainable trend factor and kind of move it the other way? So um, we, we have come up with some pretty interesting things some we can't take credit for for example the alternative quality contract is nothing maya did that is a provider payment system that blue cross has set in place with their providers uh, their trends are coming down a little bit more aggressively than the harbors and the tufts of the world although some good news we are seeing trend start to moderate uh, remember, trend inflation is not off of a static number. It's off of a, of a balloon that was previously gotten larger. It's not always off of five, it's not 5% 5 of 500. It's 5% 5 off of 900 or 800, something like that. Um, so the alternative quality contract was a game changer for Blue Cross and, and for the trust. Um, we're seeing, we had a high trend of 9% of in 2009. I'm wearing my underwriter hat at the moment. Trend is now kind of working its way down to 6%, and that's a composite trend of medical claims and prescription claims. Medical is around 4%. Prescription trend is around 9%. Put those two together, you get about 6, 6.5%. Um, we've come up with every, every Blue Cross Sport product offering the entire trust makes available to their members. So it's not as if you sign, when you sign up with the GIC, you can pick from, yes, seven plans that all look the same. They all have the same deductible and copay, just a different network. We all allow you to have any benchmark plan you want. We've created limited network plans. So if you want to throw in 
an option that costs seven to ten percent less uh, you can but the provider networks are smaller employees knowingly go into a situation where they're picking a smaller network we've got telemedicine we put up we've put together a blue cross has put together a product called smart shop where people are now getting in paid a check being sent a check at home for going online and shopping for care we shop for everything else but we don't shop for health care we just go where we're told yeah. um, the thing that I'm probably most proud of that, Blue Cross, that Maya has come up with that I think is is a present game changer um, we've came up with a new product called post 65 uh, you had about 30 or so folks that were not eligible for Medicare that were retirees in the community but were not eligible for Medicare previously they hadn't worked enough quarters most of those were probably teachers that were hired prior to 1986 that were making contributions to Social Security. So, this, so they never put in enough quarters to qualify for Medicare. So under state law, you're still required to cover those folks. Medicare won't take them. Uh, if you consider the morbid the age of these folks, most are pushing 70, 80 years old. They're a little on the older side because of when they first worked here. You as a plan sponsor are responsible because ultimately Maya is a is a clearinghouse. We take your money and pay your claims. Right? That's really what we're doing at the end of the day. Um, so you have these these people with higher morbidity that you were whose claims you were otherwise responsible for. So those claims every year would be baked into your cake, uh, your renewal cake that I would deliver you on on on, on Valentine's Day. Um, so we've came up we came up with a program where we we were able to make these individuals uh, uh, eligible for Medicare. Actually, we didn't make them eligible for Medicare. Medicare always said in their bylaws, you can still enroll in Medicare, you just have to pay an extra fee. We put this fee structure together, had our actuaries come in and our underwriters come in and calculate the expected claims for Reading just for these individuals. So we were able to come up with a formula where we got these 30, for these 30 folks or so onto Medicare. Medicare is primary. They're now paying 80% of these claims. We're now paying 20%. At one point, we have pretty much factored that these 30 or so folks were probably responsible for anywhere from $300 to $450,000 a year. We took those claims where, again, you are effectively funding and put them in Medicare's lap. Um, uh, we were the first trust to do that. We're the only entity in the state doing that at the moment. These all, if you think about it also, these retirees who are experiencing the previous plan design that we had up on the screen are now experiencing also a MedEx plan. These retirees were calling for, how do I get onto MedEx? Just because I worked 30 quarters and someone else worked 40 quarters, why do I have to pay what active employees are paying? when I can have what my retirees have, which is MedEx. So we got them onto MedEx and shifted probably three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of claims every year over to Medicare, and those are claims you aren't otherwise paying. Now you do pay some some additional costs in paying for folks part A penalty and part B in late enrollment penalty, but net net it's expected to save you about two hundred thousand dollars or so a year. We also wanted you to realize that savings immediately. We are, we're so invested in post 65 that we actually gave you one and a half percent rate decrease last year. That was, that's what got the one point something percent increase down, down to a negative 0.6 percent increase. So the retirees win and the town wins. Um, the real loser is Medicare. Uh, they're they're, they're paying the claim. Okay. Yes. The PEC, when this was brought to us by Larry, gives a time frame, and they brought it to us very late. Gives a, a time frame of one week to look at this, accept it, go forward. With the help of HR, with Judy, uh, Larry, 
we asked for an extension. They gave us a three or four day extension, I believe it was. We were able to accomplish this and pass this within the one week time frame. I being the, re the responsible party for those retirees, representing them, I could not in good conscience vote for this without the 33 people in this room having it explained to them and then asking questions and then Judy would go out and call the doctor's office and say, will you accept this? This was all accomplished in one week, signed, sealed, and delivered. Wow, that was terrific. Yeah. So the reason why it was late, uh, this, was a, this last year was a pilot program. Mm -hmm. um, we had sent all our data over to Milliman or actuaries. They crunched all the data. Um, the idea was that we were going to start rolling this for FY20. Um, but the data came back a little sooner than we thought it would, but a little late to get decisions made. Um, we looked at the data and picked, we, we, we basically decided we can roll this out to three communities. And Maya asked, what are three communities that have the profile to actually get this done <coughs> within a short window? And it was because of the relationship that we had in place with the PEC that it was decided that if we can get this done, this is a community that can get it in time. And we did. <coughs> thanks, thanks to the uh, PEC retired, retirees for getting that done so quickly. So to finish up this section, we also offer life insurance. Um, it's a very modest expense you'll see in the budget. We offer other insurance, but we don't actually contribute any funds to it. So you can buy dental insurance, there's disability insurance for some school employees. Uh, but again, the town does not contribute to any of that. So I'll thank Larry, and Larry, you can go home now. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Gordon. Thank you. I'll now answer Mark's question and some other, and, and actually talk about the budgets for next yeah. year. Yeah, I'm sorry. One, one more comment. To get back to the health insurance. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I'm going to attest to the fact that when we come to our final agreement, the last words that are said to him is make sure that you educate the board of selectmen, the select board, and now and the finance committee what the PEC is doing. Right. He did that at, at the financial forum, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter, you had the two and a half override, which was publicized. Yeah. And a member of the finance committee told the people that were watching that the override was due to the health insurance. Shortly after that, there was a letter written to the Chronicle uh, saying the same thing by a board member that I had employees calling me, school department employees calling me and saying, what is going on? We spent a lot of time to come with a 0.06 red rate, and then we're getting criticized. So we do not feel that we have the backing of the board, nor the backing of the finance committee. The backing of the select board? That's correct. Author, in terms when of... I, when I see an article written in the Chronicle, and I fired off an email to Bob, I sent him an email the night that I was watching the the uh, two and a half override. Uh -huh. and Bob can attest to the fact that he got the emails, right? And the committee was not happy with this. <coughs> We're trying to do a certain thing, as Larry has brought up to you. The numbers, when you pass an override, and we do something good with the post 65, yeah. and it comes out with an increase. You would have had a larger increase if we hadn't done what we did. But when you see the negative impact from people that are sitting in this room, you have to realize that as public officials, what you're saying, people out there are listening to. And you talk about transparency. It was not the health insurance that drove the two and a half override. Last year, we came in very good. Yes. Oh. And uh, then it does sound on. like some tremendous work has been done. We don't question that. And I'm a member of FinCom. But you've also got to understand, we've been told for year after year we should be putting double-digit increases in. 
we're the one who brought it back to the seven and a half. So you said double digit. There were double digits for saying that we should put double digits in for quite a few years. That was the recommendation you were getting. National health insurance trends may have said that. Right, and you won, you know, there was discussion between a bigger number than seven to eight percent. We brought it back to that. So it felt to us as we were going with those assumptions that we had those kind of increases. In reality, year after year, we didn't, and that's an awesome thing. But we always had pretty significant assumptions in there, and I think that's where some of that contradiction came into play. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That, that uh, makes sense. So, uh, thank you. To quickly go over, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. No, it's um, okay. The budgets for next year, um, retirement that Sharon went over, the retirement board sets it up uh, at just over 5%. And the new FinCom policy on OPEB uh, cranked it up a little more in the first year, and then it'll level off. You can see the total pension funding is just under $5 million. Um, workers' comp, not a significant change. Here's the health insurance. Yeah, what are we budgeting for that? For which? Health, for health insurance. insurance? Uh, up 1.6 percent. There's lots of pieces to it. I don't want to talk about every one of them. Um, but I will tell you this number here, that the current year, excuse me, you'll, you'll recall at November town meeting, we moved, I think it was 205,000 out of the line. And I said we could have moved more, but we didn't have anything to spend it on, and that's true. So the increase is really a little more than 1.6% based on the real run rate, um, whatever it may be. Um, I understand from Larry, uh, we don't know the range yet for Maya. We don't know the range of the, of the country's health insurance for next year. But I do know in the Maya pool, we will be below average of, any, of an increase. So. I don't even want to make up numbers, but if there's a range and there's a midpoint, Reading will be below the midpoint for expected numbers. But one of the challenges that, that Larry faces with his actuaries is he doesn't get us numbers in time for our budget process very easily, as, as FinCom well knows. <coughs> Ideally, we'd like to have this number, well, probably in December, maybe even sooner. Um, we push him as much as we can to get him to drive around on Valentine's Day. and. Uh, the range will come out in the last week of January. The governor usually says that at the MMA conference. Um, by the second or third week of February, we know our number. Last year was the third week of February. That's pretty late in our historic budget process. And for last year, with the sped up process with the override, it was very late. But it was good news. So the timing has always been a challenge on this. Um, I'm very comfortable that this number will be fine. Um, it's quite possible it'll be too high. Um, I don't think I'm going to know that by the time I legally have to present a budget to FinCom, so this is probably what you'll see. But as we discuss things, or perhaps in the floor of town meeting, if we know this is too high, we have that flexibility. Um, Medicare, we also added some money to through the override. We don't need to increase that uh, going forward. And the net. The, the net on benefits, it's a pretty nice 2.3% increase, and it's a pretty large percent of our budget, as you see, at $18 million. So the benefits budget's um, very well behaved, I guess I'll say. So back to the previous discussion just for a second. So the notion of that 11470 would be similar in assumption to what we've done over the last few years, which is something in the 70% sort of range as an expectation, Correct. with FinCom being asked to fund any overage out of free cash as a recommendation. I'd have to go back and check the exact number, Mark. I think it's seven. It could be seven and a half. It's one of those two. Is that or something? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess it also begs the question a little bit if, you know, historically, you know, we're in the threes and fours, we're budgeting in the sevens, what it's doing in the beginning part of the budget process is that it's crowding out maybe other things that we could do that by the time we get the numbers and we get to the, you know, we've sort of maybe lost the opportunity to kind of look at other alternatives. I'm not suggesting that we budget at three and a half because then we got to go to free cash. It gets to be four, five, or six. Um, but is, you know, maybe it's a good thing to discuss by the time, um, you know, just sort of, well, if it comes, Maybe to have some kind of thought about, well, you know, we're budgeting at seven, we're really running at four. If it comes in at four, this is maybe 
what we could do because you know every department had came in with 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 something that was compelling right yeah. and is it sustainable I mean that's I mean that's the, we're not going to do something because you know we have the money one year and can't do it I mean that's that's irresponsible but you know we've got a seven eight nine year now look back and you know we're getting um, you know we're getting some kind of trends I think maybe does it make sense for us then to at least on the on the municipal side kind of make some priorities and say okay if it comes in here we can do a if it comes in here we can do a plus b you know because i mean i don't know how to decide between what sharon wanted and what gene wanted i mean that's really in a way your call but I, I think maybe it makes sense to kind of look at that if we're going to be you know I, you know if we're going to be consistently over budgeting that number um, <coughs> at the expense of crowding out some things that we might want to do uh, it's just it's just philosophical just kind of thought yes but, um hard to argue philosophically but i'll say that <laughs> um, looking backwards is not the same as looking forward um, one of the last three or four years we would have missed um, it was up north of eight right. something not a big deal you know if it comes in at five now we'll be very happy historically um, we've assumed seven or seven and a half I can't remember that's two hundred thousand dollars total not a lot of money in a hundred million dollar budget but but not insignificant so the theory many years ago FinCom used no free cash to balance the budget and that's partly a whole nother discussion but part of this health insurance assumption and state aid assumption has been to take out what you just said of the budget process and to front load it so to give a number that the superintendent and the town manager could build a budget on and be comfortable with and confident not going to get worse now we never really imagined it would get better but i'm always open to that discussion as is john i think that the difficulty would be is if you suddenly have a bad situation it's very difficult to have gone through a public budget process yep. and then need to cut it. No, I know, I know. So, I know. but I, it's just this is a high class problem, as they say. We've been through it years. Yeah. Right. I ra right. I rather I rather have it come in lower than the opposite. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's still, you know, the override gave us some really good things. Um, but from what we heard over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, the, the department heads came in and said I could really use this or that, and they're not. It's not a. It's not a. You know, nice to have. These are these are things to, to help run the department. So I just want to keep that in mind when it gets to you guys. You know, I, I, we'll we'll yeah. we'll we'll continue that discussion. Yeah. Just, just a second, Vanessa. I, I I can't see Vanessa, so I don't I don't I mean I, I literally can't see her because it's of stick. Uh, we're right here. I, I, I'm partially blind, so um, uh, she. Thank you. Raised, raised thank you, Andy. Um, yeah. So. I, Barry, FinCom has had these discussions in the past, and the concern is that while it could be funded for one year if we if the numbers work in our favor in year two, that may not necessarily be the case. And so you could be, many of the asks that came forward from the department heads are in the form of hires and so or positions. So I, the general consensus has been to be, to be hesitant about hiring something that is not predictably sustainable. Now, if we wanted to have a list of priorities that we could, that should the premiums come in at X, Y, or Z rate, what we do with that 50, 200, 300,000, I think that would be great. I mean, that's, that I, I, and I think that would, that would be a nice option. Um, but I would hesitate to do it with people. Yeah. Just a quick add, if I could add. Yes, sir. About the point also, the other thing is that we know um, state aid, we're, are, we seem to be overly optimistic every year and it never achieves. I'm not optimistic at all. <laughs> well, Steve, uh, the assumption is optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally we'll see So the there's a little bit of a balance, but the notion of priorities is great. Yeah. Um, and, and? Very similar to what Mark just said, that um, last year I think I, I quoted the idea, but it was not anything that I um, voted on that we lower the number of the assumption on the um, on both the assumption about how much money we get from state we need because collecting more accurately what we've seen in past years and similar to um, and similarly will lower the assumption on, on health insurance and perhaps in a way that actually is sort of budget neutral but it is mm -hmm. more accurate um, in terms of what we've seen in recent years. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've been Chuck. Am I allowed to talk, or we're here for the? You, for you, the, you, you may talk. Please so talk. I, I, I totally get, and I've been sitting on my hands here, but I <laughs> totally understand uh, why you know we've been. But I look at the angst that we've gone through the past couple of years, uh, not just the override year, but the year before. Yeah, and a lot of that was driven by the. The money that was the, the funds that were needed to account for the health insurance estimates. Maybe if we had used four uh, percent or whatever, we wouldn't have gone through the same level of bang. I, you know, I, I remember the middle school teachers coming up two years in a row. I don't know. I'm just maybe that wouldn't have happened if if we had but budgeted more closely than. Uh, and but I understand why we were. Right. but you know we should have a longer conversation on that when, when it gets to the fifth level. You know that I think we went through a lot that we maybe didn't have to go to after the actual numbers came in. People worried about their jobs sure. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's what led to Arthur's comment too about kind of. You know, yeah. we're working our tails off, and everyone's thinking that it's us. And I, and I get, I get that. That that's a compelling point, and I, I think it's important to to know. Bob, it's um, it's a complicated discussion because you have state aid that's unsure, health insurance that's unsure, and the use of free cash, and all three of those work together. Um, any one of them you could look at and criticize, but I think the combination is okay can always be improved. FinCom this year went down to a million from a million two uh, at the financial forum, which made perfect sense. There's, there's no easy yeah. answer. This isn't math. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is art. Don't, don't, don't forget the uncertainties in RMLD. Uh. But you just want to make sure that you're not focused on any one of these aspects because it's really the big group put together. And um, again, I, I, understand, I understand totally and I'm sympathetic, but the most important thing to the school department and to the towns is some sort of floor, some sort of budget certainty that doesn't get removed in the middle of a process. Right. Imagine a budget that looks like it's uh, perfectly fine, it goes through the superintendent's hands, your hands, and all of a sudden we get some d development in February that causes the middle school language problem to happen. That'd be horrible. So it, again, it's a collaborative effort. There's no easy answer. Bob, to follow up on some of the comments we've, we've heard tonight, um, and I've always been uh, somewhat con <coughs> confusticated or you know, uh, uncertain about. We seem to, you know, we seem to always think the state would be more generous than it is, and so in the budget we have. A greater we count on a greater amount of state aid, aid than we invariably don't receive, and and on the other hand, um, we seem to over budget uh, uh, somewhat for health insurance. So, is there a way to sort of? I understand that all three, you know, are you know, that free cash, they're all related, but um, one thought would be to. Um, have those items, uh, the budget, reflect what we, more closely, what we think may, may happen based on our past experiences? Yeah, I mean, again, there's no right and wrong way here. Well, there's a lot of wrong ways. There's no right way. Um, one of the reasons for the two and a half is so that we can yell at our legislators, couldn't you at least get us two and a half? Whereas we budgeted zero, Right, then they're heroes. And you'd be surprised right. at how much of a factor that is. Yeah. We've been we've been getting 0 0.8, 0 0.7. The school aid has been terrible, you know, it's per student. So again, I'm not saying that's a right or a wrong thing, but that's another factor. Right. Just wait till those construction trains right. start coming down. Yeah. Well, less. well then it, you know, I think that we should double our expected exactly. state aid. <laughs> we should say five. <laughs> So if there's no questions, I'll quickly move on to capital, and this discussion will be brief. Um, I wrote the board a memo to update the five areas of, of capital, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of them, but I'll hit them quickly. 
and I'll, sp I'll speak for the superintendent. Um, the first and most important capital project, large capital project for us both is building security. Um, I hope through this memo you understand that we can't possibly accomplish uh, April 2019 town meeting action on this. It's just, it's just the procurement's not gonna work. It's conceivable that we could, at the fastest, ask for a special town meeting next fall, or this could wait to November town meeting next fall. Um, as you can imagine, one of the challenges will be, we'll, we'll certainly meet with the elected boards and, and FinCom in executive session, but the amount of detail we can share with town meeting and open session will not be typically what town meeting wants. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll have to just give summaries and give general statements, and I know that that's not what some town meeting members are used to seeing. And they'll just have to accept, for security purposes, that's what we'll do. Yeah. So this that'll also be an element of the discussion as to how to approach this is how to provide information. And as you, as those of you that were in executive session, uh, the one we've had so far, mm -hmm. you just got summary level details. I can't say offhand that we wouldn't have shared all those with town meeting. But there's definitely a, a cutoff of information, I guess I'll say. Um, we have not heard anything else about any kind of state funding. Uh, the elections over, the bond bills uh, you know, may or may not happen. We'll still certainly look at those opportunities. We're assuming that we're, this is on our nickel, right? I, I would assume that, and okay. you know, we'll hope for the best. We'll ask, certainly, in a loud voice. Um, but I expect that um, we'll come together on this sometime after April town meeting with a, with a definitive timeline. We don't want it to go past next April town meeting. We have to do something. So that's our first priority. Now, in the capital plan, that's um, still set up for uh, approval this April, and we'll discuss that in the budget process. I'll leave out elementary school space study to the school committee. Community center, we've done nothing further, so I'll, I'll skip that. I know that uh, Vanessa and John are working on capital. I do want to spend a little time on recreation, but I, I want to hit um, Public Works just to get it done. And just thank you for your uh, indication during the budget process that economic development should move forward. Um, that was very helpful. Um, we do have some, uh, hopefully we'll have some meetings set up in September with a local uh, community as well as in Beacon Hill. September or? Uh, December. 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 Yeah, since September I've had a number of meetings, but okay. now we can go to the state. I, I do want to talk a little about recreation. Um, FinCom requested in town meeting approved 200000 for Turf 2. That procurement process is underway. I've met, uh, I want to say, four times with the schools on this with uh, recreation and athletics. Um, as opposed to what I said in October at the financial forum, where I was hopeful that a special town meeting could speed things up, there's just no chance. Um, we've gone over the procurement process. Um, we've gone over the thoroughness we need to do, and we are going to be challenged to bring FinCom in the budget. I'd have to present to FinCom good details. The timeline's not great for that. I'm much more optimistic that for the town meeting we'll be able to have those details, and I'll just apologize in advance that this could be a floor of town meeting thing. Um, we'll do the best we can, but we, we do want to absolutely get this right. Um, for Turf 2 only, we are pricing, I guess I'll say, four options. One is the field as it is for size, one is, one is extended. One is the field with lights, one is without lights. So if you do those combinations, you get four different prices. You mean with existing lights? With, ex with the, to replace the existing Turf 2 lights, or to leave them there. Leave them there. So those would be the two costs. Um, staff, facility staff will also estimate four birch meadow fields and what that would cost to do at the same time. We are not using the 200,000, that's not what it was for, but because we'll get that work done on Turf 2's lights and we already have estimates um, previously and updated, we'll be able to do that. So that we'll be able to present somebody that makes decisions with all of this information. Um, ultimately, it will be the school committee um, if the timing were out, that can make an, a, a can, that can vote on a plan moving forward, and then FinCom slash town meeting can agree or disagree with the school committee. Uh, but turf two is their turf, so to speak, <laughs> yes. um, and it is the hope that this will fit into the January time frame. Although we're not not at all certain of that, and the school can be, may be able to take action, it it may not work out. Well, so question on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, in your memo, uh, where it says pricing options for turf two, 
replacing as is doing a significant field extension. Previous language described a slight field extension. Something changed? No, it's it's just my words. Uh, okay. It's significant in the cost. Okay. Um, and, and honestly, it was presented in the past as you had to do it. I think we've now seen it's an option. Okay. So it's a, an option that should be evaluated. Um, and then the lights, the same way. I mean, honestly, if you're going to do a field, it seems to me you ought to do the lights. Right. But let's price it out. Let's let's put a menu out there, and then you know, hopefully, in times for school committee to make some kind of a recommendation. And just as, just as a reminder, all those other recreation and athletic projects are not funded and can't be in the current version of the capital plan. And, and when you talk about um, providing an estimate for lighting the other fields as well, in the past you've alluded to the thought that doing all five fields might have some cost savings oh, baked into lighting, it. Yeah. Are we going to are we going to see? Both versions of that, you know, the a la carte and the all the yes, but that'll be staffed on, so it won't be as precise. Sure. But yeah, you'll be able to see that. Okay. And and I'm assuming the, the in the capital plan, it's two years from now. So my assumption would be, here's the cost to do it today, and here's the cost to do it in two years. We're gonna estimate. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Vanessa, did you have a comment? I had a question for Bob. Bob, um, has the recreation committee weighed in on the so turf two? We everyone has agreed is a high priority, but for the other Chimato needs as far as lights or other facilities, mm -hmm. has Recreation weighed in on their priority list? Yes, they did that two years ago. Uh, they did, and I know they're doing another survey right I, now. I know the survey that just question. went out. That, that's why I asked. So the, the priority list that they did in 2015, um, I don't know if that's changed since. Um, so before we prioritize the birch metal field lights, I'd be, I would want to get input from recreation to well, see. Respectfully, what, what FinCom asked us to do is price everything. It doesn't make any sense to ask recreation anything until we have that. Then we can share them. Here's the pricing. What do you guys think? And that makes perfect sense. But it, it, to, to ask them now, I don't know what we'd be asking them without having prices. Right. Even without pricing, just what they're need is from a use or repair and I'm assuming that's why they included those questions in the survey to find out what the community thinks. Yeah. yes yeah so, okay um, Bob just to uh, recall the di turf two the size of turf two now is too small to be a full field is that correct it can only be a practice field the, the fields are used for high school boys across the uh, no, for uh, field hockey. Field hockey, sorry. Um, goes across that parker. So the, the um, field is used for practice, for some sports. Mm -hmm. um, this, the, the possible or the um, option that's going to look at the extension would allow it to be used for more sports. Yeah. Um, for games. I think you also right. have lighting yeah, issues around that there too. The cross games at the stadium field because they need that. The girls' field is larger in the game. Yeah. Larger. Oh right, the boys. Sorry, the, the boys, boys cross. It is. Plays there. It's the girls' field is a little. Okay. The rules of the game require a larger. Sorry. Right. Or in bones field. For so where we. The way we understand that extension at this point is that that's something that is really um, more of a, a want than a need, but it's being evaluated. And so the committee will, when all that work is done, as Bob said, that will come back to the committee to really evaluate. Yeah, I got it. Finished? Yeah. Okay. Just so, so I think to that point, Elaine, isn't there also a lighting issue with Turf 2 as to its usability? Yeah, we need the lights. Sorry. Yeah, the lights have to be replaced. The safety issue of right. the lacrosse ball, the lighting there now can't, can't do that. They can't play night games. It's a safety issue. And it's not a decision we just made. It's it's, I think the league is based yeah. on Yeah, it's used for practice, but yeah. Yeah. game game conditions. Because of the speed of right. lacrosse ball. You right. can use it for night soccer or mm -hmm. whatever, for you, but mm -hmm. not for you. You're saying somebody misses a catch or an errant uh, ball. It gets lost in the lighting because of the lighting designs. Yeah. Those are, yep. yeah, they're old lights. Yeah, okay. So that was going to be one of my questions. Why why replace the lights? But that makes sense. 
Oh, oh. Go ahead. oh no! If you were gonna, no, no. It's, well, I, I guess I, I guess my point is I know Bob, you went through this really quickly, and um, sort of the recurring theme of all these things. While we recognize the need and the urgency, there's sort of either we don't have enough information in terms of what it's going to cost, what it's, you know, how we're going to design it, what we're getting from the state. We really don't know sort of how we're going to finance it. And then that in turn, some of the stuff may be done uh, on things that are going to be required to be done outside of the levy. I think it's important that as we develop this thing, the way we kind of did with the, with, with, with the override is to, is to give out a level of expectation about when we might go to ask the voters for something. And granted, none of this stuff is fleshed out enough to kind of do that yet. But at some point, some of these things are going to have to go to the voters to ask for some type of an exclusion. I think it's sort of important to lay out even a very, very cursory timeline about what that might look like broadly and when. Because the thing that I think we all learned from the last override process was even though you say something a hundred times, people are going to say, you never told me that. <laughs> right? So I think we have to start saying it now, 101 and 102, that this is going to be what we're kind of looking at. It might not be in this year, two years, or three years, but that's going to be the horizon about when we might be going to you to ask for some assistance. And by then also, too, library, high school stuff, that's starting to kind of get that in more of our rear view mirror. So I know we don't have enough to do that now yet with, because all those things are just it's all too much up in the air. But in terms of what a timeline is, what an order of magnitude is, um, I think it's important that it, it just, you know, it's, it, it could be an agenda item on everything that we do that says TBD, but it just should be out there so that folks know that at some point we're not funding this with just what we have in, in the bank right now and, and what we're going to do on our operating stuff. It's going to it's going to happen. We need to set that expectation about that that it's going to happen. And again, I'm sure we'll still get five years from now when we're, when it's a Killam School or a senior center. Oh, you never told me I wouldn't have voted for the override five years ago if you told me this. We're going to get that, but I just think it's really our job. This board, the school committee, FinCom, um, to really just start just just talking about it. It's going to happen. You know, obviously we don't know when and what, but it, we need to set that agenda. We need to set the table for that. That's all I'm saying. I think that's yeah. where it starts. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we got to keep saying it. Bob, just one question. Sure. Um, could, could you just quickly explain to the uninitiated uh, uh, on? Uh, that are watching the difference between you have a number of uh, words listed within this table. Some say debt slash or debt and a. Uh, some say debt and some say x debt. Could you just quickly explain to the public um, because the differences are are important. Okay. Uh, debt is debt. X debt is excluded debt that's already been issued. So the high school, the library. Mm -hmm. um, debt NA is not yet authorized by town meeting. So it's a plan, it's a planning document. We haven't asked anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably the only kind you have on this. Occasionally there's debt NI, which is not yet issued. It's been authorized but not issued. <coughs> so there's still right. some uncertainty right. on the cost or the timing. So so the X debt or the, the uh, that's things that, like barrels that's something would end. That we've gone out and yep. asked the community for for money, and right. now we're paying it off over an extended outside of tax time. levy. Outside of our right. yeah, the, what we receive in taxes, tax levy. And in terms of Barry's comment and planning going forward, um, there's five million dollars on the left in that sort of tan box of recreation slash athletic projects. There's Killam, or the elementary school space issue more broadly. Yeah. There's a community center and the DPW project, none of which can be funded inside the levy in the next 10 years as of today. Right. Now, the only, I was thinking of what happy things could happen to change that. Um, we could get $4 million of building security grant funding. 
and all of a sudden we have four million dollars that we're planning to spend and we can do it on something else but I just don't see a lot of happy surprises that are going to change especially those last three because they're large the recreation athletic things you know a million two million three million you might be able to squeeze one or more of those in mm -hmm. um, this is the kind of discussion we had uh, just before the library but maybe we just didn't put it in the right context enough right. so I, I agree with you that it needs to be said and I, I understand that if all of a sudden it's a year or two from now and turf two has been repaired it's going to want to be a lot of people wanting the stadium turf done and it's going to need it we can't afford it yeah right now right. A question for you? yes sorry I just yeah. I would just like to clarify and make sure that um, what we're talking about is an elementary um, master of elementary planning, space planning, and enrollment study. It's not specifically focused on one school. We need to look at right. everything programmatically and make sure that we are making the best decisions. I think everyone recognizes yeah. that, that school, uh, Killam School, is going to be part of any solution but we are looking holistically right. at this. Right. Which means that it could actually be more than just Killam. Right, so, so we've been very yeah. explicit at no, using uh, no. the term that. I just used Killam because it was one word that I, described I know, the but problem. but then people, huh. then we get calls. Yeah, so yeah. Right. We can okay. just say elementary, yeah. Yeah. you know, space School. planning. I Kill them in the mix. Yeah. 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 I, th thank, that's a, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank Lori. you. Um, yes, Mark. Uh, speaking of call, my phone lit up the last few days, which is, kind of the phenomenon for me. Um, I think Barry's point is spot on. I think that uh, kind of seeing all these things together and understanding the difference between here's kind of what we've got in the kitty versus what is going to be outside. Yeah. But if you look at some of the projects also, and I'm not taking a, a shot at anything, there's not really a champion yet for the community center, senior center sort of activity. Correct. And that probably is something I would suggest that the board might want to think of a little bit more about is how to how to talk about that. I agree. Um, I think that'll help frame the discussion. Yes, better for people. Yeah. Know, well, we had. I mean, Jane came in here. Um, I don't know, six eight months ago, and and, and we got a I full presentation. Maybe last winter, maybe and then recently, was part of the budget. a presentation about just the total inadequacy of what they do and what's needed. So yeah. I think that right. kind of set the framework. And you know, again, these discussions are are all. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the champion would be us. Well, yeah. right. not only is it inadequate, it's, you know, serving the fastest growing population in Reading. Absolutely right. Which is another interesting right. sidebar to yeah. that. But, and yes, it's on the board, but I think as people are thinking about, gee, how do I want my tax dollars or even excluded debt dollars to get right. spent? Yeah. Right now, it's on the list is, yes, it's a problem. Yes, we're looking into it, and the right. latest up is that you know there's no update since September. It's only been three months, I get it. But okay, what is the process? How does that move ahead? How do we you know, think about, in, in the sense that there are studies that are done for where the school needs going to be? What's the need going to be here? You know, taking it forward, taking right. it to the next steps, bringing it up there, and saying, okay, you know, we're going to have some options that range from you know refurb to redo. You know, use open space that we have, et cetera. I know it's in the discussion, um, but it doesn't have traction yet, if I can say it that way. Yeah. And it probably does need to get traction so that we yeah. can understand the priorities. And last but not least, I think on the on the uh, on the life of the other Birch Meadow fields, I think kind of sharing it's the recreation committee, whoever it is, here's here's what the need is, here's why. Here's what's happening with this particular field and why it can't be used. Here's what happens if if things change in terms of opening times, closing times, things like that. Here's kind of the, the express need and why. Um, I think that will help people. And at the very point, it, it tends to be reinforced in the two times. Yeah, and, the, and the sooner the sooner we get on that, um, I think, the better. Yes. I mean, I mean the one thing, to, I mean, I get nervous when we say, well, this project needs a champion. Because what what it means is is that you know we may have there's a number of things here, um, and and I would hate to see the discussion frame because they're you know again for for lack of you know that that they're, they're more active people who want to see us you know sort of the school stuff done, and there's maybe a less active voice for seniors. I don't I don't I don't want to see 
I would hate to see the discussion framed as sort of pitting one group against another. I think we need to frame it in a way that kind of says that, you know, a, a, a senior, you know, that the, that the champion of this is not just the seniors. The champion is going to be the town because we view that as a, as a priority. And so what happens is, like anything else, when you have lots of needs and limited dollars, you know, I don't want it to be the louder voices win. And, and so, you know, that's got to be sort of put in there. Maybe as part of the school, sp you know, the school space, are there opportunities to look at sort of situations where we share some space? I mean, I think we need to get out of the box and um, and, and look at things because the, the needs outweigh what our available funding sources are. And, and, and I don't want it to get to be, you know, schools versus library, seniors versus school. I mean, it, we can't do that. We just can't. So, so. Yes, Fidesz. So one of the things that I think is so important to this discussion is that we've talked about and set aside for this year, which is the master plan for the town. I'm not saying we should update every data point, but I think it would behoove us to work with the school committee, with FinCom, with CPDC, with Recreation, to identify with RMLD, we have some, we have space available in the town. Um, this building, as it stands now, barely houses everyone. Um, what can we do about that more broadly? So I think, you know, I'm glad that the school is moving forward with an elementary school space study. I think the town needs to take, take, needs to take a similar approach to evaluate what we have in a broader fashion. Yeah. And then we could, we, we could highlight that in some way in the capital improvement plan. Hey, maybe we can make another subcommittee. Maybe, maybe stop that. Um, Yes, Dan. Yeah, I wanted to say a few things about the DPW building project. Uh, one half of the concept has been talked about extensively, the, uh, the great cooperation between three towns, potential negotiations with Camp Curtis Gow and the state. But what is the primary reason for doing this project? It's economic a, in greater right. amounts than we're going to be spending on this. So. My question, and I'm going to be a dog about this thing, whether I'm on the board or not, <laughs> what is the town doing to satisfy the question people are asking? How are we going to engage a real estate professional? Is that our new Andrew Corona or someone else to tell us what is actually feasible yeah. on that side? A lot of people are dreaming eight-story Marriott's. I don't think so. But something of a smaller scale is likely. We have to know what those pro formas are. Uh, we have to know what the economics are. Okay. Otherwise, why are we doing this? And yeah. FinCom, please stay on top it of this. Be, you know, Ask the right questions. Right. It could be any one of a number of things. It could be. Yeah. But let's get the question way. answered. Yeah. Yeah, right. It depends when you ask the question as to what the answer is. Yeah. When Andrew asked it two years ago, housing was the biggest answer. And I don't think any of us wanted to hear just housing. Right. Yeah. Not just. Possibly mixed. Could be a component. Possibly. Yeah. And if you do something like a uh, Reading Woods, right. which is a cash cow, then that might make sense. Yeah, so we looked at, you know, the cost benefit, students coming in. Right. Um, you know, roughly we're looking at, I'll, I'll pick a pretty wide range of purpose, two to five million dollars of revenue. Fully built out. Fully built out. And then you have to time that out with the need to go to the voters and ask them for 30 million. Or whatever that's going to be. Is. Yeah, it's tough sell. Yeah, yeah, very tough I sell. Know. Unless you put some kind of a total package together with a developer, right? And front money for that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's having two or three towns makes and, it even And that's more actually how we cap the landfill. We got the okay. developer to kick in and yep. do that work. Yeah, and understood. Give us it is. Money. It's a it's a complicated thing. So please uh, <clears throat> work on the other half of that equation. Yeah. Um, so on that point, and Nessa, your comment about this building um, spurred the thought to, Bob, is there an opportunity with these conversations starting in December to maybe even think more ambitiously about what we could do with the site at, at, at Curtis Bell? Is it, you know, could we create more space to alleviate space constraints in this building or to rethink how we use this building or anything along those lines? Um. They have bigger guns than we do, and they're not real interested in sitting us to begin with. So it's it's, it's an art. It's a negotiation. Um, I Thanks. still think it's very possible. There's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but we have to be careful with our ask. Um, one of the reasons that a DPW is acceptable at the margin is 
because we both work on similar natural disaster events and serve the same community. So the missions are very closely aligned, if you think of it that way. And that's not something I thought of until a couple of years ago, as we discussed it. Right. Whereas the senior center, it's like, what? You know, why would we want that here in terms of missions aligned? So it's, um, it's an interesting discussion. But, you know, land is a tough thing in this town. It's not a lot of it. But people very creatively reuse it, as you see all over town. So, you know, we've talked about for the senior center, one of the board members know we talked about doing a land swap, a building swap. There's all kinds of creative things you could do. But we'll continue to discuss them. Bob, I'm sorry, could you just reiterate for all of us, because it's been a little while, what the top, you mentioned the top three or four projects that that we're going to have to go debt exclusion or, or something. They're, they're the biggest items that we don't yet have money for. And I understand. Okay. Um, ele elementary school right. spaces yep. is one. Mm -hmm. A community center. Yes. To the extent that's different. And then a, the DPW project are the three largest projects. Yeah. So I, I think we. This, this board, or somehow we need to come up with a process to prioritize those three. Yes, if I, if I may also, um, a very important, uh, a key player in this is the Permanent Building Committee. Yeah. Now, they don't prioritize and they will not decide, but they will help a great deal in any of these projects. Okay. We'll determine the feasibility and what the options One of the are. things that we've learned, um, Joe and Kevin go to most of the meetings, if not all, one of the things I've learned in the last six months is the PPC is a little further downstream on a process and a project than I might have guessed, yeah. which is fine. Um, but they, they're not interested in being at this point of the discussion in this room today with us. Yeah. They want us to hash a lot of that out first, and then they want to come in when the community has made some decisions, whatever that means. I can't, they say, I can't say I blame them. Exactly. <laughs> they learn the hard way. Um, yeah. But, but they are a key player in this, and as, as Barry knows, um, they are meant so that we don't repeat some of the mistakes in the past about right. rushing. Yes, without yes. In, uh, yes. Without information. So uh, I'm just asking the, the, board, the board this. Is it our job to start getting the word out on these three needs, prioritizing these needs, discuss, discussing these needs, well, I think Bob is on lead, if I'm not mistaken, in the charter. Well, and, and uh, you have we have a subcommittee. We have a subcommittee. We We've already actually there you go. met. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we'll continue to meet yeah. and you know bring back you know what we're finding right. based on the research. Yeah, I mean it's in motion. Andy. Good, good, good. And, and to summarize, capital. Um, if I had to submit a budget, a budget that's balanced to FinCom today, it's the same one November town meeting. So. Um, I expect by the time I actually do submit it, it'll be a little different. You know, two or three small capital items that get added. I don't know if any of these bigger things will be solved by then. Right. I'll, I'll try to present you a couple scenarios in case this one moves up, in case this one slows down. Time. Yeah, I'll just do the best I can. So, I, I would, I'd like to caveat my previous comments by noting that the school committee has a obviously a large role in the elementary school space uh, discussion. Probably the role. The role, <laughs> yeah. We're, you know, uh, <laughs> that's pretty hard. I didn't so. want to step on any, any toes. Hope it didn't step on any toes there. Okay, so great. I think we're now ready for Jane to present the enterprise. Funds. Yes, great. Jane, Thank we'll you. start off with you first next time, maybe. <laughs> okay, let's go last. But it, we went to sleep at the end of the hey, Come on, Chuck. Yeah. This stuff's interesting. Jane, sorry for, for the delay, but I, I think the questions were, were help, are helpful for the board and, and the, the community at large. Um, so this is um, the DPW chat again for enterprise funds. And the reason I put it back up is because I want to show you the water sewer um, mm -hmm. has 50 employees. And uh, there are no openings um, in stormwater, same thing, no openings, uh, open positions, I should say. And of course, it, the override did not affect any of those groups. So um, 
water um, has um, about 111 miles of water main in town. Uh, it's two, two main tanks, Auburn Street tank that you'll be uh, seeing in the next couple of years to be replaced. It has 750,000 gallons and we're going to a composite elevated tank so it will never have to get painted again, which will be good. And then we have the Bear Hill tank that has about a million gallons. Um, two booster stations and we'll drive which is currently um, getting renovated in Lockwood Road. Um, over 7,700 residential connections, 70 municipal ones and 240 commercial. In 2002 we did a um, master plan that was updated 10 years later and we've been working off of that plan. Um, in 2019 there was about $100,000 to put into the capital to look at um, where are we now? We've added all of these um, uh, developments. Uh, so, you know, can we to do a hydraulic study to see what the impact of those known developments are in the, the future ones? Um, so that should be coming up somewhere in the um, springtime. Uh, the funding for all of that master plan primarily comes from a combination of, of course, the annual capital plan and we've received over $4 million from the MWRA to fund them. Um, so, I mentioned the LCCA program last time. It's where we do all the testing, uh, living copper testing in town buildings, schools, and all the fountains, and we've done all of that. Um, but I think as important that it's, it was really well um, laid out and the master EP actually um, has incorporated that in their training and education uh, program for like how to, how to uh, manage this, this task. A water conservation program that we have, we've given back over $600,000 to residents and rebates for washing machines, toilets, rain barrels, irrigation. Um, we have a lot of water-saving devices down in the DPW for people to just take, sign off and take. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that has helped with the consumption. We have an average of 44 uh, gallons per person per day, which um, state average is um, 65, so with 33 roughly percent less, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and so the two major, you know, projects coming up are the Open Street Tank, and we're working on some of that, and you'll see the Main Street um, uh, water main cleaning and lighting. And so that's um, just started. Let's see. So when I start thinking about some of the things that Reading does that's kind of unique, that makes us different, um, it, uh, the unidirectional flushing program is one of them. And, and so we used to do flushing where you would open gates on both ends and the water would come out through like the, the hydrant. And so um, we worked with a few consultants and they said if you do unidirectional, it's a stronger force in one direction so it cleans the pipes um, a lot better. and. Um, the, you know, higher velocity, it uses less water because before they used to just sort of run it at 15, 20 minutes and now they have this very set program on how long to run, run it. So um, we started that a couple of years ago and we're going to continue doing it. It's been really successful. So we have redundancy now with, um, you know, our, our water. We have the 36 inch um, the MWRA pipe that went in that, you know, I know affected a lot of folks in town. So, you know, that's done. We have two new water vaults in, off of Manus and um, Hopkins. And um, the, the next step is we have a SCADA program that um, sort of uh, monitors all of that. And that's near completion, but not, you know, should be in the next uh, few months by the end of the year. And then in FY20, um, you know, we're looking to hopefully do uh, a beam in some of the wells, which would be a cost savings, um, since we have that redundancy. And there'll be some funding, I think, in, um, in April to, um, for FY20 to, to do that. From the state? Um, no, what we're hoping to put some money in to have a study done to say what's that, pro how, what do we have to do because it is a long, yeah, from the state, but yeah. it's a long process, so we want to be able to do it, do it once, do it right. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
So I mentioned training before, but I think with water, it's kind of important to, to note that out of those 15 employees, nine of them have distribution licenses, which is remarkable because there are communities that don't have one person with a distribution license. So the fact that you know these guys, it's a, it's a difficult license to get. We have people D1, 2, 3. Our supervisor has a D4 license. Um, and it, so, I mean, that they know an awful lot about the water distribution system as a result. Jim, before you jump to the yeah. hour, are we fully compliant on buildings on lead now? Well, well, town school? No, well, kill them when you say compliant. Uh, <laughs> so you said that we have a, a, a program. We have a program, so we right. know what, what some of the issues are, but we can't fix them at all. But it's, I think Killam has like water that they bring in, or they, you know, they have what they think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that they can only do hand washing. And that's, we know what we have, put it that way. But okay. you know, we can't fix all of. Is that the only place right now that? Uh, I think. Uh, is it? I think so. I think so. Do you yeah. Think of anything, Charles? There's a few other locations in the where we've gone to hand wash, yeah. um, but it's not at the drinking fountain. The Killam is the. Killam is the only yeah. right. And that one can't be addressed until there's a broader. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, just to correct Birch Meadow, we have a couple of bubbles we took out. We also have bubbles there, too. Okay. I was wondering if the source of the lead issue was inside the buildings or are they in the, the water mains, like the end residents should be. So, um, so we have just finished a complete lead audit that, that is, um, was required by the DEP. Um, we're way ahead of a lot of communities in doing that, so we, we know exactly how many lead lines are in town, and we're actually tracking even goosenecks where other folks aren't even doing that. So we know where we are with it. And in, um, in the next year, again, we're going to be looking to, to see how do we how do we approach remove those because you, you can't you know do everything at once but um, we always remove all all lead lines as we do replacements um, so we're pretty good but there are we do have lead that's all we ever used for many many years yeah so we might want to test our water yeah is it residential testing as part of the program oh yeah yeah yeah. So the source system consists of 108 miles. I should say there's about 36 um, wells, potable wells in town. Um, you know, that so people have got on their own property? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so the sanitary source system is about 108 miles. We have 12 source uh, pump stations. Um, the master plan uh, that was, was developed in 2010 oh, looked to replace you know, the 12 of them. Um, aging reasons. We have West Street and Batchel to both replace at this point. Charles Street will be starting in January. We had um, uh, a little meeting last Thursday night at the police station. Um, two attendees <laughs> that were very interested in that pump station. Other than that, um, so that and the remaining nine will be replaced in the following 10 years or thereabouts. Um, the other thing that kind of makes us pretty unique is um, our INI reduction, our in infiltration inflow reduction program. So, um, Jay, could you explain what that is, uh, infiltration versus inflow? So um, we have, it, so you don't want to have like like water or anything going into your system. You want it to be as tight as possible because you're also paying for all. Whatever's you know, so it's it's sort of sealing. There's a lot of it's it's the next slide actually. The next one. Um, so it's looking at manhole rehab, you know, because making sure they 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 are um, uh, well you know constructed. The CCTV inspection is like a camera, sort of robot that goes down to sort of looks at you know is there things leaking into the sore. Um, we clean we you know do cleanings that's outsourced. We seal um, the manhole holes because sometimes you know water could leak into it, and then we do smoke testing. We put you know pipe smoke through the pipes, and it should come out through somebody's chimney or the manhole. If it comes out other places, then you know you have leaks. 
And then we have um, two vacuum trucks. Sorry, what? So you're you're talking about groundwater, just general groundwater leaking in to to the to, to the pipes right. where there are, there are cracks in the right. pipe. Right. Or just are illegal connections sometimes. Um. And yes, illegal connections. Yeah. And um, you know we have found more and more. I mean, the system is, we just did smoke testing again back a few months ago. We probably do it every few years or whatever, but we pretty much know what's what's hooked up at this point. Um, we have two vacuum trucks, which, um, you know, it, again, is unusual. We ha I think we had one that was about 10 years old. We replaced one last year. They are a godsend. The guys use them all the time. You vacuum out the, um, the, 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 the septic. Honey wagons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So, so just, um, for instance, back, back in um, about three months ago, Charles Street Pump Station started to fail right before we were going to get it replaced. And it's the largest pump station in town. Um, it carries about 1,100 residents. So that was a fun phone call to get. Oh, yeah, it was scary. So Peter Isbell, who's the water and sewer supervisor, is phenomenal, and he, you know, he was trying to think of like, what can I do? How can I fix this? Because it was going to cost us an awful lot of more money to bring in that contractor faster and whatnot. So he used our two trucks, tried it up. Our two trucks did not keep up with that. So he hired another three or four other back trucks, and he brought them all in, and they just kept up with the flow, and he got those pumps fixed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, didn't he have like 72 hours before houses were going to Oh, yeah. It was, yeah, yeah he, was, he was white. He yeah. was white. So just for the general audience, explain why, I, I know why you need a pump station. It's very important to have a pump station. Um, purpose of the pump station. Yeah, so it's some of the um, the flow, I mean, if, depending on the angle of the pipes, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you got to push it, it up and out. Or go back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or go back. Yeah. So the pumps take that yeah. to a higher elevation. Than right. right. And when they're not working, it's backing up, backing right. up. Yeah. yeah. So. So this, for the first time, um, you know, it was kind of big news I sent Bob about a month ago. For the first time, all of the pumps and all of the sewer um, are working. You know, they're chug some are chugging along, but they're all working. So, um, so that's, a, you know, that's a real testament to their, their work, really. So stormwater um, is just rainwater or melted snow that runs off streets. I think people, you know, kind of confuse sometimes like the catch basins with the manhole, the whatever. This is like water that goes into the catch basins. That's fine, um, but it goes out into you know pipes or and then ultimately into um, you know areas where what we what we are now um, measuring is the outfalls. That's that MS4 permit. So we have to measure what's in what's in that. What kind of contamination is in that yeah. um, so and, and the, the other thing is like we f we're finding that when we are cleaning out the catch basins that like people will put in like you know the, the bag the dog thing and I mean all, oh, all of that is, is like not good you know <laughs> so um, so yeah there's a there's a lot of uh, just people just think it's sore it's not sore it's not <laughs> the storm water it goes yeah, you into don't it. don't sweep everything from the street right. into the right. into uh, those right. are we still get a lot of petroleum dumped in there or not um, too much? I, I don't hear about that oil honestly. changes yeah I, I hear more about the, the dog mm -hmm. stuff yeah. and I, I well they just leave it in the town forest yeah. Well. yeah um so that's that and this so we have uh, several apps which, which we're working on um, there's this catch basin app and it, it shows you every catch basin in town and that's the green they're all inspected the red ones were inspected but they have issues and then there's a few white ones here and there and those haven't been inspected yet so we, we're using an awful lot of apps the water has an app for their gates um, they have one for the unidirectional flushing um, so you know the guys have you know have these the G text which is kind of a tough book um, and they have access to our water and sewer cards and you know other GIS and um, so they they're good about tracking that 
and that's just a quick snapshot. So we have one person primarily who's doing all the catch basins, and he sort of goes around. He says, you know, what was in each one of them, and that helps. You, that helps at the end of the year for the tracking that has to be done for that permit too. So, and you know, it's also good for being able to plan because at the end of the year, you know, the, the supervisor knows, hey, I've got to, you know, do X amount of catch bait. These things are falling apart, or this one's fine, or whatever. So it gives them a lot of data that they didn't have before. And it's just an extra few minutes that it takes them to do it. So some of the challenges is, you know, are the funding. I mean, we, you know, it's when you think about it, we have 111 miles of, of water mains, and they last about 100 years. And it costs roughly about 1.1 million, roughly, to to replace a mile. So you know, if you're not putting in, a, you know, a couple million, let's say, average every year, you're not going to keep up with that. Right. Um, and so, you know, also the bandwidth between water so and storm water. So it sounds like there's a lot of people, 15 people, but they do an awful lot. They they, they oversee an awful lot. So. Um, we have a lot of projects with pretty active town in making sure that um, you know our infrastructure is is, is well managed. And another problem is that we're in the street, so we do kind of get a lot of calls about oh, you know traffic and this and that. So all of these projects, unfortunately, for the most part, we're, we're disrupting neighborhoods and whatnot. But they have to be done. Um, the technology we have. Um, a real need for continued, you know, the, the G techs for the field because that's what the guys use. That's what we want them to use. They have access, you know, um, remotely, and we want want it that way. And the training on how to use that to do that. So th that's one of the things. I mean, we, you know, we have several guys who are well trained in it, but we're always looking, you know, every year to add more equipment and have them train, have more people train. And then the unknowns, like things that happen with the pump station and the water main break, you know, that's just, the, you know, with any structure, but it is very disruptive. Um, so, so level one summary, there weren't too many changes. Again, I, you know, I was talking to the, the water source supervisor. He has two long-term seasonals that he was using at one point when we first implemented the new direction of flushing, and he said, you know, it's going so well. He goes, I, I would rather have one permanent person that could help with it, and then some short-term seasonals that could help with, um, you know, uh, painting hydrants and that type of stuff, what used to happen, like, for the summer help, you know. Um, water expenses, you know, we have licenses for the hydraulic licenses and various things that the, those that software is just increasing every year. So I just have added some money into that. And because we're on the streets a lot, we have I put that additional money into police details. Um, Sore expenses, there really weren't many changes with salaries, so it, you know, it was just mostly the contract. Um, but again, the software licenses have increased. And stormwater, there was a slight increase in overtime, and then um, again, the software licenses. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Barry. Jane, I have a question. This comes up all the time, and I know it's been addressed year after year after year. Um, given with all the conservation, obviously, we got, I think we have the same problem with like DPW, we're not selling enough water, right? Yeah. Uh, like that's probably not selling enough electricity. But there's still kind of a, a demand out there for people to kind of put in a second meter. Um, you know, dealing with the irrigation because it's not going down. You know, we, I know we, MWRA charges us, uh, you know, a fee per water that we use. But a lot of that stuff, if it's used for irrigation, it's not going down the store. And so, you know, is there an estimate about how much revenue we would lose on that? Um, is it something that we could look at again? Um, is it just something that you know we wish would go down a rabbit hole and never emerge? Because we get calls on it all. You do, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the last time we discussed this, and I apologize if it wasn't a full board as opposed to different members, I know it's been both, um, we thought we really needed to do a full presentation before you next set water sewer rates, so that would be um, which is typically, I don't know, March, April, May, it could yeah. be before or after town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the objective would be not to lose revenue, right. to just rearrange the revenue. Right. So, yeah. In other words, you'll need to raise the rates on people that don't have second meters. Correct. 
pursue or inspection. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's well, the point. It's a zero sum yeah. game. Right. So. Is there a minimum rate that people are charged? So yep. yeah. if you are a person and you live alone and you use less water than a family of four, say, mm -hmm. um, you are still charged a minimum rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's 30 very, bucks, 30 yeah, bucks. It's I very think. low. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, it is a minimum. Minimum. 30 bucks a quarter. Probably the cost yeah. of reading your meter. Uh, right. Yeah, that's the theory. Um, the reason I ask is, you know, as we talk about seniors, you know, this seems like something that might hit them right disproportionately. Mm -hmm. um, has consideration been given um, either to reconsider that? Uh, it just, it seems like they're... By hitting them with a minimum, they're frankly seemingly paying more than their fair share. Um, Is there an administrative reason for that you, you process? Can't, you can't discriminate based on age. So you can discriminate based on usage. Right. So one of the things the board discussed but never went too far on in the past was tiered rates. People that use zero to something pay a lower per whatever, and it goes up. So there's a handful of communities, not a lot, that do that. I can think of two communities that have tiered rates. And it hits you know, a car wash, a hospital, a business a lot harder because they're the biggest users of water. So that's one way you can do it. And effectively, the you know, older person that lives alone at home is going to be one of the lowest users. Although we're doing an economic development agenda, do we want to be? Well, uh, you know, that's another. So thing to we look can at. provide, we can present the board some data on distribution of usage. Yeah. We have done that in the past because once upon a time we thought of um, perhaps moving some of the water down onto the property tax, and we had to study the correlation between those that pay taxes and those that use water. So the, the data is available. Um, I don't know about the rest of the. Board. I'm going to say there's not a lot of low, really low users. Hmm? There's not a lot of low, low users. My guess is it only happens when someone goes away for three months. Right. For, during I mean, quarter. it's so low that it's yes. really more about, I think somebody used very little water, they would still go above that, that minimum, very little water, because the minimum is more just, yeah, I'm shutting down my house for the, for the winter or something. Yeah. No, wait, it's very low compared. The greatest threat economically is the passage of overrides to seniors. There's no yeah. way around that. Okay. This pales by comparison to the impact on a senior from an override. So yeah. what we can do to avoid overrides, how we manage our money, is, yeah. is critical. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it could still be worth reviewing, right? As we talk about various ways where we can help seniors, it's a little here and a little there, start adding up. It might not be the answer, but it seems like it's worth exploring. So that would be great if we could just get the um, distribution of the, for the second meter when we set the rates next year, just to look at it, and even if we just say no. But just to say we look at it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. <coughs> so that summarizes the budgets. Yep. <laughs> Um, the, the two takeaways I get every year, especially the last two years, um, you, don't, you don't know and you don't get to see what other communities are like. I do a limited amount of that. Um, our budgets are put together with a lot more long-term planning than most. Mm -hmm. You saw a little more of that tonight because of things like water and sewer and, and capital. Right. Um, but that goes throughout the organization, that no one is interested in short-term benefits. They're interested in long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. and, and then part two that you did see a little more of last week is um, the departments really work together very well. Um, employees tend to work together very well. And that's been by necessity in the past. Um, that's the way we've avoided some overrides, is not having too many kingdoms by having people that work together. Right. So that um, there's no such thing as a slow time in the collector's office. They have other work to do. Um, Certainly going forward, I, I don't know what you'll have to say tonight. All is welcome, but you don't have to conclude things tonight. You can send me comments. We can meet and discuss. Yeah. I need to balance a budget in January. Yeah. So. Is there a preferred way for you to get, I mean, we're not meeting. So this is our last meeting of the year. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, is there just, you know, just sort of individual emails from us, phone calls? I, I'm open-minded in the past. Um, not and when last did you year, need I've, to die? 
Um, your next meeting okay. would be helpful. I need to give FinCom something um, mm -hmm. probably towards the end of January. Um, Don't you give that to them after the schools are done? Yeah. And the yeah. schools, I forget, they're voting, I think, in the third, I'm sorry, the fourth week of January. Oh, okay. So I have to And the capital, as you know, this year will be a little complex. But okay. um, if you want me to, I can try to create a spreadsheet of summary of some sort of things that people brought up. That, that would be new. helpful. Yeah. Rather have to review I haven't here. done it myself yet, so I've just yeah. listened. I mean, I'm aware, but right. I haven't created that. Well, when you do it, just CC us all. Maybe with a, a, brief, to do that. a brief notation about the claim benefit of yeah. the additional person. Yeah, yeah Bob, you, you, I, did anyone go through the presentations and identify uh, the requested extra positions? Well, any of us? Any of us, yeah. I, yeah. Well, no. FinCom. You mean it's a summary? No. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean. That would be the next. Well, Bob, I mean, Bob is going to be putting that into his recommended budget, and maybe some will be there, and maybe some won't, but that's. that's yes, Bob. Yeah, and, and when I. It's, it's not just about money, it's not about what we can afford even this year and next year. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a perfect example of Jane still in the room. Um, Jane has asked through her department for a number of changes from long-term seasonals to full-time employees with short-term seasonals, such as she did tonight. Um, let's say she asked for six. I don't remember. It's four to six. Um, even if we could afford to do that, I would not do that. Um, to go out and have to hire six people in the short run next summer um, is too much risk, too much hiring risk too much budget and flexibility going forward. Um, yeah. Some of those, and, and I don't know what priority, we'll discuss them, could well be great ideas. When I'm trying to balance a budget, it's not just to make the numbers work, it's to make sure that you have flexibility going forward. Yeah. So some of the requests, when they're for full-time employees, get a lot of scrutiny. And you know, I would much rather have two part-time employees than one full-time employee, because then if one of them leaves, at least one of them is still here. This yeah. And if you need to have two people in an office covering at some point, there's two people doing the job. Right. So there's lots of components to this that aren't just money. Um, the money is sometimes kind of the easy part. But we, we try to have these discussions. Not every department's the same. We don't have any part-time police officers, for instance. Yeah. Um, but we try to work this out, again, with a longer term in mind. Um, I'm, I'm never anxious to add full-time employees. Yeah. I, I didn't notice much in the presentation that you sent us. I could only find uh, there was a few clerical. Yeah, I public, think Sharon public had public sir, yeah. public service uh, services. No, nope, you didn't. One. Yeah. I had two. No, yeah, Sharon. Yeah, Sharon had a couple, hours, couple yeah. three, uh, right. five, five, five hours. hours. Yeah. Yeah. With the clerk's office. Clerk's the, office, yeah, HR. The office and the that was it. Okay. All right. yeah. HR. And then the additional hours That's here and there. The yeah. No, there weren't a lot. There were not a lot. No. Right. And I think the the police asked for another cruiser because they have police officers, which makes sense. The, yeah, they, re one. they replace two a year. Yeah. They need to replace three a year for a couple of years, and then they'll be fine. Go okay. back to two a year. Well, I think one of them. The report was that it, it was. One of those not crashed. worth, you know, putting the money into it. it yeah, the that's the one that November fixed. town meeting replaced. So you asked for feedback. So I'll try to organize it yeah. in some way that yeah. you can indicate, but free free format feedback is most welcome. Does anyone have anything? Uh, does the board or, or FinCom anyone have any thoughts on the requests that have been made so far? Yes, Mark. Sorry. Um, to the end of the discussion on, on people letting people would be great if we could kind of have a historical FTE chart by department. That's beautiful. I know it's it's up. Haven't I told you every year that's hard to do? Yes, you have. <laughs> I'll you tell did. you again. It was, uh, it was done this year, which is great. Hard to go back too far. Yes, and, and to be I'm honest. <laughs> to go back five years. I mean, it's hard. more uh, again, it's more interesting on what we do than the yeah. number of slots that do them, I, I think. But FDs you know, are, are what, you know, what our, what our bottom salary line is, roughly. So I think it's important to know that. For me, I didn't see any great 
uh, increases, and I'm sensitive to the fact that we would like to make the override last as long yes. as possible. Yes, I couldn't agree so with you more. minimizing the hires, yeah. you know, mm. uh, unless there, unless you consider them really right. necessary. No, that's that a really was, good point. That was I'm the feedback. Yeah. Same yeah, here. same here. Uh, I would much prefer to spend money on a one-time thing mm -hmm. and then have it again next year for another decision, right. uh, unless it's really a crucial need. Yeah. So, uh, any other thoughts, or we can we wrap this? I'm also so, so Bob. Thank you for and, and thank Bob. you, and also to the Good. department. Yeah. Thanks to everybody who, that especially the ones not here, too. <laughs> three nights. Especially the ones not here. Yeah. I think for those people who paid even modest attention, they'll realize how hard people work and how much gets done with limited resources. So I think that that's an important. It's a very thing diverse amount of work. Yeah. 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 That's always interesting. We have some minutes We do. Yeah. Yeah. I, was three, three yeah. table I was going to table those. I was going to ask the board if um, I'm ready to go. We can table I, I have some edits. We so have, I have some edits, and we have nine minutes to go. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, do we get in trouble with the town clerk? Well, she was just, she was just here. here, right? Yeah. No, I don't think so. All right. How about you, you, know, you want to do one set the 16th? Because we're, we're almost two months away from that. So. Um, yeah, we can. Why don't we do one set, but the one that was on the run, agenda? We'll run, we may run over. Well, you, you can start an article of business before 11. You just can't take up anything right. else. Yeah, yeah, I just want to like the old like American like League. Board yeah, whatever you want. Let's just, can, can we table? Some of them came in kind of late, and I haven't. Uh, yeah. No, that's a fair thank, statement. Thank All right, that came in after the time. Yeah. Uh, anybody can request draft minutes. So yeah. These right. are available now. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Thank uh, I came up with an all inclusive. Merry Kwanzaa. Yeah, there you go. <laughs>